Messies was always a good choice. So if you didn't buy a ticket, you really lost out. Sorry to hear it. Would you please stand as we sing How Firm a Foundation? How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more? say that to you he has said to you who for refuge Jesus have fled fear not I am with thee O oh, be not dismayed for I am thy God and will still give thee aid I'll strengthen thee help thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my right just omnipotent hand when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee i only design thy dross to consume and thy gold
darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love display, you suffered in my place you bore the wrath reserved for me now all i know is praise Hallelujah. all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is going to get through this message with that thing staring at me. <clears throat> you guys are champs for hanging in here today. We've, we've come with some really heavy stuff, and y'all are hanging in there with us, so we appreciate that. Uh, I want to talk to you this evening. I've titled this message, The Problem is Enmity, Not Ethnicity. The Problem is Enmity, Not Ethnicity. Because I can't do it, man. <laughs> bust out laughing any minute. The problem is enmity, not ethnicity. And I'm going to be speaking to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. I'm going to be reading that passage from the New American Standard Bible Translation, or as those of you who are familiar with the Just Thinking podcast, the non Armenian Standard Bible Translation. <laughs> Ephesians 2, verses 14 through 16. 
For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death, that is, by the cross, having put to death the enmity, enmity. It's a word that has all but disappeared from our contemporary lexicon. I mean, think about it. When was the last time you used the word enmity or heard someone else use that word in a conversation? Exactly. (laughs) But despite its rare usage today, enmity is a word that carries significant weight and importance, particularly when considered within the context of Scripture. By the way, speaking of context, I want to say at the outset of this message that I am rather dogmatic that when Christians engage in apologetics, that is, when we engage the culture in a defense of the truths of the gospel, it is critically important that we begin that defense by defining our terms biblically. Now, every Christian in this room is an apologist. The only question that remains is whether you're a good apologist or a bad one. But every one of us is an apologist. That's 1 Peter 3.15. Now, I I sort of emphasize the importance of defining our terms biblically because words have meaning. Words have meaning. And it is the meaning of words which, for better or worse, establish the context for our apologetics. By not defining our terms biblically, we risk engaging the world using the world's terms on the world's turf. Consequently, we run the risk of ceding the moral, ethical, and more importantly, the theological high ground to an unbelieving culture and end up losing the argument altogether. As Christians, to not stand on a solid biblical foundation as it relates to biblically defining the terms we use, that opens the door to pluralism. Pluralism is the idea that all beliefs are equally valid, and that's exactly what the culture is trying to tell you today. As D.A. Carson declares in his book titled The Gagging of God, subtitled Christianity Confronts Pluralism, quote, an entire vision of reality is at stake. Let me pause here, by the way. That's why you're here. That's why you're here at this conference. It's because there is an entire vision of reality that is at stake. That's exactly why you're here. Quoting Carson, one thing is very clear. It is quite impossible to be a Christian in any responsible use of that term and be a pluralist. The pluralist will explain the Christian and will doubtless conclude that the Christian is too tightly bound by tradition, naive in the area of epistemology, intolerant of other views, and so forth. All those things are happening, by the way. If you're not being accused, if you're not experiencing one of these accusations or or more of them, That is, you're being accused of being too tightly bound by tradition. You're naive of what's going on in the culture. You're intolerant of other views. If you're not being accused of any of those things, you're living in some kind of bubble that you need to burst and get out of. Continuing to quote D.A. Carson, he says, Pluralists are inconsistent in that they want to be understood univocally while insisting that ancient authors, let alone God himself, cannot be understood univocally. So you're getting... Let me pause here and say again, what you're getting is, even with evangelicalism, you've got people like Tim Keller and others like that trying to argue, well, nobody can really understand what the Scripture means. You know, none of us is God, you know. So they're, 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 they're coming at us now saying, well, God can't be understood. How do, how do you know? I mean, even as Virgil and I, and you, you have Jim here, who's not just an expositor, but he's an exegete. <clears throat> You can tell a person what a, what a word or a verse means in the original Hebrew or, or, or Greek language, and they'll say, yeah, but how do you know, how do you know that? So, so, so it's, it's, it's a circular questioning, always trying to deconstruct uh, uh, what we know and how we know it, even when it comes to Scripture. That's what Carson is saying here, that the pluralists are inconsistent and in that they would argue that they want to be understood with one voice, but there's, while insisting that the original authors 
and let alone God himself, cannot be understood with one voice. Carson says, they may have many religious experiences, but none of them deals with the heart of the human problem, the sin that is so deeply a part of our nature. Let me stop here again. I'm going to get through this quote. I promise you I will. <laughs> See, what I run into many times, and I was saying this on Twitter just a couple weeks ago, what you're finding within the social justice movement and the, the critical race theory movement, and, and Black Lives Matter is a, a good example of this, because the payoff for them is to get paid. What you'll find is that they want the problem to be something other than sin in the human heart. They want the problem to be something else. They want the problem to be something that they can target that will get them paid in the end. So they'll say, well, the problem is racism. The problem is, is discrimination. The problem is um, you know, the weight of my student loan debt. They want the problem to be something else, something that will reward them and give them the payoff that they want. They, they can't afford to let the problem be sin and that the solution be uh, biblical confession and repentance and coming to faith in Christ as a result because that doesn't get them what they want. So, the, so, so scripture's not enough for them. They need to have something else that's the problem that can be uh, either uh, identified as a problem with no solution, but as, as, as long as that problem gets them what they want, that's what they want the problem to be. It's never sin in the human heart. So for instance, you've got the uh, dialogue is ratcheting up again about gun control, an oxymoron of a term if ever I heard one. They want to blame the gun. They want to blame the gun. Why? Well, because the goal is to... Um, What's the, what's the right word for it? Really, I think, is to, uh, the, the target is to, to, the total deconstruction of the Second Amendment. That, that's, that's really the goal. But what they're having to do is, with these, especially with these mass shootings, they always want to blame the gun. They never want to point to the motive or the intent in the heart of the person. Because I say all the time, the night before or the day before the shooting in Texas, and then this recent one in... Um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before those incidents occurred, those, those weapons existed. But they hadn't harmed anybody the day before. Those same weapons existed the day before. Didn't shoot anybody. Why? Because there was no animate human being with the intent to pull the trigger, get the gun, aim it at targets, and then pull the trigger. But they want to say it's the gun because the goal is to minimize, if not eliminate, your right to own weapons. That's not Jim Osman saying that, that's me saying that. So don't come at, don't come at Jim. Continue with, with D.A. Carson. They may have re many religious experiences, but none of them deals with the heart of the human problem, which is the sin that is so deeply a part of our nature. In short, we must deal with massively clashing worldviews. Again, that's why you're here. This is really a worldview conference. It's got a cool name, the Equipping Conference. But what you're here to really talk about is, as D.A. Carson has put it, massively clashing worldviews. And part of our responsibility, continuing to quote Carson, part of our responsibility is to explain competing worldviews from our vantage point. Let me stop here again. That's what an apologist does. That's what a capable, equipped, prepared Christian apologist does. They explain competing worldviews from the biblical standpoint. That's why it takes Virgil and me three hours of an episode of Adjusting Your Podcast, because that's what we're attempting to do. We're trying to help equip folks to understand things like critical race theory, deconstructionism, um, salvation, and other theological topics, so that they can, they can understand and be able to articulate these issues, because that's what 1 Peter 3.15 commands us to do. And I want to challenge anybody here. I'm not trying to be condescending toward anyone at all, but if and you know this in your heart if this is true. If you're a lazy Bible reader, you need to repent of that. You need to repent of that. And you need to get serious, become a serious student 
of the Bible. Don't just read it. You need to study it and dig into it. Get a Greek Hebrew lexicon and understand what these words mean in the Greek, what they really mean literally. So you can peel back the layers of God's word because I promise you there's more there than what's on the page. Carson says, we cannot possibly engage at that level unless we ourselves have thoroughly grasped the biblical storyline and its entailed theology, unquote. Again, that's why you're here. As apologists for the gospel, and as I said, every true believer in Christ is an apologist. It's vital that we not embrace the language of the culture as we endeavor to engage the culture. Did you understand that? You must resist the urge to embrace the language of the culture while you're attempting to engage the culture because the language of the culture is going to change from the language they're using today is going to be different tomorrow. Your job is to become so good at understanding and articulating the scripture because you know scripture does not change. I don't care what the language and vernacular of the culture is, scripture's not going to change. And it's still going to be able to address that issue regardless of the language that the culture uses. So you need to dig into that book. That's your job is to become better at that book, understanding that book, not understanding the culture. Okay? Christians are to love others, yes, but not at the expense of the truth. This is what narratology tries to achieve. It tries to make you feel guilty for standing on the truth, and then they'll accuse you of being unloving because you don't cave. This is why we have the I don't care mug on the <laughs> Just Thinking website. I don't care. Parenthetically, we have Galatians 1.10 to give you context there because Paul, the apostle Paul is saying, listen, if I'm trying to be a friend to the world, then that would mean I'm not a friend of God. And guess which one of those is going to take priority? Guess which one of those is going to win out, according to Paul? That's why we say, I don't care. I don't really care what the world thinks. I care what God thinks. So, yeah, Christians ought to love each other, but not love others, but not at the expense of the truth. We dilute the message of the gospel when we exchange biblical terms for the vernacular used by the world. John MacArthur says it this way. He says, the health of the church and the impact of the church is always based on the church's ability to keep objective truth clear. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And the health of the church is always based on her ability to keep objective truth, that is biblical revelation, what we have in scripture, clear and never to blur the line between truth and error. When theology is watered down, MacArthur says, that line between truth and error is rubbed out. And I'm sad to stand here and say that the enemies of the church aren't just outside the church. We have enemies within the church who are trying to do this very thing. who are trying to water down the word of God so that that line between truth and error is rubbed out. This is why you have many evangelical churches embracing the LGBTQ agenda, saying we need to make room for them. They're embracing critical race theory. They're embracing liberation theology because we, they, they, they think the church is some big tent. As I said on one of the episodes, they think the church is like a Fred Flintstone water buffalo club. As calls for racial reconciliation and social justice increase both in fervency and in frequency, Christians must be willing to call a thing what the word of God calls it. The word is homosexuality, it's not gay. What the, what the culture calls racism, the Bible simply calls hate. That's 1 John 2, verses 9 through 11, and 1 John 3, 15. Listen, <clears throat> what the world calls racism, the Bible calls hate. Listen, there's only two attitudes you're not going to have one against, uh, towards one another. One of two attitudes. I either love you or I hate you. Period. There's no isms. There's no phobias. I either love you or I hate you, according to Scripture. That's clear. Read First John. I either love you or I hate you. The only question is how that love or how that hate manifests itself. There's no isms. To show ethnic prejudice or ethnic partiality, which is a more biblically accurate term, ethnic partiality from what society calls racism, to show ethnic partiality toward another image bearer of God is sin. That's period. There's nothing else to say about that. This is James chapter 2, verse 9. Hatred of any kind is a matter of the heart. 
That's why enmity, not ethnicity, is the root cause of the societal disharmony we are witnessing in the world today. Now, just a little bit of exegesis here. In its singular form, because the plural form of the word occurs in Galatians 5, verse 20, the word enmity appears only eight times in all 66 books, across all 66 books of the Bible. Those eight occurrences are found in Genesis 3.15, Numbers chapter 35, verses 21 and 22, Deuteronomy 4.42, Ezekiel 25.15, Ezekiel 35.5, as we just read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. And in each of those instances, the word enmity denotes a very intense, fierce, intentional, and deep-seated spirit of animosity or hostility between parties that are in opposition to one another. The 18th century Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards elaborated on that reality when he said this, quote, Natural men are greater enemies to God than they are to any other being whatsoever. Natural men may be, may be very good, great enemies to their fellow creatures, but not so great as they are to God. There is no other being that so much stands in sinners' way in those things that sinners chiefly set their hearts upon as God. Men are wont to hate their enemies in proportion to two things. One, their opposition to what they look upon to be their interest and their power and ability. A great and powerful enemy will be more hated than the one who is weak and impotent, but none is so powerful as God. Man's enmity to others may be gotten over. Time may wear it out, and they may be reconciled. But natural men, without a mighty work of God to change their hearts, will never get over their enmity against God. They are greater enemies to God than they are to the devil. Yea, they treat the devil as their friend and master and join with him against God, unquote. In the book titled Man's Enmity to God, the 17th century Puritan theologian Stephen Charnock says this. He says, every action of a natural man is an enemy's action, but not an action of enmity. A toad does not even um, every spire of grass it crawls upon nor poison everything it touches, but its nature is poisonous. Certainly, every man's nature is worse than his actions. As waters are purest at the fountain and poison most pernicious in the mass, so is enmity in the heart. And as waters relish of the mineral vein they run through, so the actions of a wicked man are tinctured with the enmity they spring from. But the mass and strength of this is lodged in his nature. There is in all our natures such a diabolical contrariety to God that if God should leave a man to the current of his own heart, it would overflow in all kinds of wickedness. For the mere nature has fundamentally and radically as much of this enmity as the worst. For the disposition is the same. Though the effects may be restrained in some men more than in others, no man is any more born with a love to God than he is with knowledge of the highest sciences. There is indeed an active power to the attainment of those by the assistance of a good education. But man hath only a passive power to the other, as being a subject passively capable of the grace of God. This inherency of the, the inherency of this enmity in our nature, the psalmist expresses when he tells us, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They are estranged from God from the womb. They go astray as soon as ever they are born. That's Psalm 58, verses 3 and 4. They go sinfully before they go naturally. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent, which you know is radically the same in all of the same species, unquote. Now, whether we want to admit it or not, the fact is that you and I are congenital enemies of God. We're born, we're conceived as enemies of God. Consequently, that makes us congenital enemies of one another. Enmity, not ethnicity, is why there can be no horizontal rec reconciliation, that is, between us, one-to-one -one human beings, apart from, first of all, having vertical reconciliation between us and God. 
But in either case, whether vertical or horizontal, it is faith in Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit and regenerating sinful human hearts that makes that reconciliation possible, not any man-centered or man-concocted method. As the 18th century Welsh minister and Bible commentator Matthew Henry said, if God justified and reconciled us when we were enemies, much more will he then save us when we are justified and reconciled. Now, sadly, the church's understanding of the biblical doctrine of enmity is so languid that it is virtually absent from our preaching and our apologetics. But there was one individual on whom the doctrine of enmity was not lost. His name was Jupiter Hammon. Jupiter Hammon. Jupiter Hammon was born a slave in October 1711. He died a slave sometime around the year 1806. Literally every breath, every heartbeat, every blink of his eyes, every cough, every sneeze, every hiccup that Jupiter Hammond experienced over the course of his 95 years on this earth was as a slave. On September 24, 1786, Jupiter Hammond gave a speech in New York City at the inaugural meeting of an organization called the African Society. Hammond's speech was titled, An Address to the Negroes of the State of New York, also known as the Hammond Address. Among the remarks Hammond made in that speech was this sobering admonition, quote, Now you may think that you are not enemies to God and that you do not hate him. But if your heart has not been changed and you have not become true Christians, you certainly are enemies to God and have been opposed to him ever since the day you were born, unquote. Now, I want to remind you at this point that Jupiter Hammond took every breath, literally, of his nearly 100 years of life in this sinful world as someone else's property. And yet the biblical doctrine of enmity is something that Hammond clearly understood. Now, contrary to what was a common stereotype concerning slaves, Hammond was not unintelligent or uneducated. Both of Hammond's parents, his Father was named Obadiah, and his mother was named Rose. They were both literate, meaning they both knew how to read and write. That was rare, of course, but it was a a common stereotype that if you were a slave, no slave could read or write. But Hammond's parents could. They were both literate. And though a slave, Jupiter Hammond's owners, his owners were husband and wife Henry and Rebecca Lloyd, they were Anglican. Okay, and they provided for Jupiter Hammond a rather rudimentary education through what was known in the Anglican Church as the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. That was the Anglican Church Church's missionary arm, the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. As a result of that education, Hammond would go on to become the first black poet in the history of the United States to have his literary works published. Jupiter Hammond was a Christian who was convinced of the sovereignty of God. Convinced. So convinced was Hammond, in fact, that uh, so convinced was Hammond that God was in absolute control of everything that occurred in his life, that he saw even his own enslavement as God's divine providence in his life. Now, let me ask you, let me pause and ask you, no show of hands. What is there going on in your life right now that you're complaining to God about? Here's a man who lived to be almost 100 years old, and every tick of the clock of those 100 years, he spent as a slave. Yet he attributed that. He attributed his station in life to God's sovereignty. Now, I don't know what's going on in your, in your life, but you're not a slave. So whatever it is that's going on in your life that you're complaining to God about, as Hammond declared in the aforementioned address to the Negroes of New York, quote, listen closely to this. Hammond said, we live so little time in this world that it is no matter how wretched and miserable we are if it prepares us for heaven. What is 40, 50, or 60 years when compared to eternity? Unquote. 
What are you complaining about in your life? Though in bondage physically, Jupiter Hammond was a free man spiritually. Perhaps freer even than some of you who are within the sound of my voice tonight. Hammond firmly understood that emancipation from his slavery to sin was a far greater concern and importance than being liberated from his physical shackles. It's my personal belief that Hammond's understanding of what Scripture teaches about enmity demonstrates that he was, a more orthodox, he was more orthodox in his theology than many formerly trained theologians who have earned seminary degrees. And this guy was a slave. But regardless of the level of theological acumen Hammond may have possessed, I'm convinced he would be criticized, if not altogether ostracized, by many evangelical social justicians today for holding to what they would undoubtedly regard as a hermeneutic of passivity, for having the temerity to believe that his subjugation to his white slave owners had been providentially ordained by God before the foundation of the world. No way, if Hammond were alive today, there is no way he would survive within wokeism. Absolutely not. Within the church. Because they would say, you're crazy. How could it have been God's will for you to have spent 95 years on this earth as a slave? I have no doubt whatsoever that Jupiter Hammond, were he alive today, he will be labeled either a race traitor, a coon, an Uncle Tom, a house Negro, or worse. He would have been accused of not being enlightened or woke enough to the historical struggle for justice in America by those who are of a similar shade of melanin as he was. In other words, Hammond would be denigrated and dismissed, especially by many black social justice advocates today, for not beholding to what I refer to as a gospel of perpetual grievance. Hammond, Jupiter Hammond was a slave for almost 100 years. Yet his belief in God's sovereignty was so deep He didn't complain. Now let me just put Daryl in the mirror. Daryl, could you do that? Whatever it is, whatever, whatever, see, listen. <clears throat> Unless, I don't, see, I don't hear any balls and chains clinkling around here. So I'm, unless I'm in this guy's shoes, look at what people are complaining. Look at, look at what people are saying they're oppressed about today. I'm tweeting from my $800 iPhone in the comfort of my air-conditioned BMW from my two-story house in suburbia, from my office, home office desk where I work remote that I'm oppressed. <laughs> Listen to what Booker T. Washington had to say about people like that. Booker T. Washington, in his book uh, titled My Larger Education, he, he wrote about people like that, people who all they do is just walk around preaching a gospel of perpetual grievance. Just everything's grievance, everything's oppression, everything's woe is me. Listen to what Booker T. Washington had to say in this story here. Please listen closely. Washington writes, he says, a, a story told me by a colored man in South Carolina will illustrate how people sometimes get into situations where they do not like to part with their grievances. In a certain community, there was a colored doctor of the old school who knew little about modern ideas of medicine, but who in some way had gained the confidence of the people and had made considerable money by his own peculiar methods of treatment. In this community, there was an old lady who happened to be pretty well provided with this world's goods and who thought that she had a cancer. For 20 years, she had enjoyed the luxury of having this old doctor treat her for that cancer. As the old doctor became, thanks to the cancer and to other practice, pretty well to do, he decided to send one of his boys to a medical college. After graduating from the medical school, the young man returned home and his father took a vacation. During this time, the old lady who was afflicted with the cancer, okay, called in the young man who treated her. Within a few weeks, the cancer, or what was supposed to be the cancer, disappeared. 
and the old lady declared herself well. When the father of the boy returned and found the patient on her feet and perfectly well, he was outraged. He called the young man before him and said this, My son, I find that you have cured that cancer case of mine. Now, son, let me tell you something. I educated you on that cancer. I put you through high school, through college, and finally through the medical school on that cancer. And now you, with your new ideas of practicing medicine, have come here and cured that cancer. Well, let me tell you, son, you have started all wrong. How do you expect to make a living practicing medicine in that way? Here's the point. Washington went on to say this. He says, I'm afraid that there is a certain class of race problem solvers who don't want the patient to get well. Because as long as the disease holds out, they have not only an easy means of making a living, but also an easy medium through which to make themselves prominent before the public. If the patient gets well, an entire industry of victimhood will get cancer and die. This would be the best thing for the black community. Until blacks throw off the shroud of victimhood, they will be at the mercy of doctors who treat a cancer that does not exist, but that they are paying for. You get the point. Washington's words are important for us to consider because you're hearing a lot today about systemic racism in America. But for something to be systemic, hear me out here. This is, again, I said earlier about why it's important for us to define the terms. Understand this. For something to be systemic is by definition to mean that it is literally everywhere and in everything. That's why systemic means by object, that's what the systemic means by objective definition. To say something systemic is systemic means it's everywhere. So if America were a systemically racist nation, I wouldn't be standing here today in the middle of Idaho. Bro, <laughs> do me a favor, look up the percentage of black population of Idaho, will you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. If America was systemically racist, why would I be here? Listen, the problem not only in America but in the world at large is not systemic racism, it's systemic sin. Now, sin is everywhere. Sin is the most systemic reality on the face of the earth. But as I said, see, the woke don't want that to be the problem because God gets the glory for that. They get nothing. They get nothing. You got to be? We doubled it. We doubled it? Gotcha. <laughs> Two percent. Two percent. <clears throat> See, we do our research on the just thinking. We research everything. The British preacher and writer J.C. Ryle reminds us of the systemic nature of sin in his classic book titled Holiness. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that there's two books you need to have in your library. Actually, there's three. If you have not read J.C. Ryle's Holiness, I commend it to you. Please get a copy of that book and read it. It, it will change your life. It really will. J.C. Ryle said this. He said, sin is the universal disease of all mankind. Search the globe from east to west and from pole to pole. Search every nation of every climate in the four quarters of the earth. Search every rank and class from the highest to the lowest. And under every circumstance and condition, the report will always be the same. Excuse me. Wow. The report will always be the same. The remotest islands in the Pacific Ocean, completely separate from Europe, Asia, Africa, and America, beyond the reach alike of oriental luxury and Western arts and literature, islands inhabited by people ignorant of books, money, steam, and gunpowder, uncontaminated by the vices of modern civilization. These very islands have always been found when first discovered the abode of the vilest forms of lust, cruelty, deceit, and superstition. If the inhabitants have known nothing else, they have always known how to sin. 
the sinful attitudes, biases, and prejudices that you and I harbor toward one another all have the same root cause and origin, sin in the human heart of the individual. Jesus makes that abundantly clear in Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 23. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable that he had uh, given them in the previous verses. And Jesus said to them, are you so lacking in understanding? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? So it's not, the culture's not the problem. The gun's not the problem. White supremacy is not the problem. Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated? And he was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Virgil and I are both biblical counselors. We have a passion for that. My wife and I do biblical counseling back in L.A. <clears throat> through Grace Community Church. And one thing we try to make clear, I don't care if it's premarital or marital, I don't care what the specific issue is, the root cause is always sin. Somebody in that relationship does not want to give up their sin. They don't want to give it up. They do not want to give it up. For the young people here, I know we have a boyfriend and girlfriend here. We may have some, I think there's an engaged couple here, or soon to be engaged couple. <clears throat> but especially for young people, because my heart is with you all. Before I met Melissa, let me just be transparent with you for, for a second. Before I met Melissa, I came out of an abused, abusive marriage where my wife was the abuser. That God used that situation to put me on the path to becoming a biblical, a certified biblical counselor. I've just never understood why spouses sin against each other. I just, I don't understand it. I just don't get it. But if you're taking notes, there's a book I want to re recommend to you. It's called When Sinners Say I Do. When Sinners Say I Do by Dave Harvey. <clears throat> and if I could just put on my biblical counseling hat for one second, the one piece of marital advice that I would give you, I don't care if you've been married 40 years. You need to remember that you are married to a sinner. And the best thing that you can do for your marriage is to, be, is, is to, is to pre-forgive that person for when they sin against you, you will forgive them. Because they're going to sin against you. They're going to sin against you. That's the one piece of marital advice that I have for you. You get that for free. We're not, we're not building that to Jim to the church. This is just free. You need to remember that you are married to a sinner. So when Sinners Say I Do by Dave Harvey, <clears throat> I commend that book to you. It was the 19th century Baptist preacher, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who said this, <clears throat> sin poisons the wellhead. Sin is in our brain. We think wrongly. Sin is in our heart. We love that which is evil. Sin bribes the judgment, intoxicates the will, and perverts the memory. We recollect a bad word when we forget a holy sentence. Like a sea which comes up and floods a continent, penetrating every valley, deluging every plain, and invading every mountain, so has sin penetrated our entire nature. I got to say one more thing about the whole uh, marital thing. <clears throat> When you, uh, many of you probably had marriage vows that you exchanged with one another when you got married. The thing about vows is that, and, and, and I, I, want, I want the young people to hear me here, young people who are not married but who may want to be married someday. <clears throat> Do your marriage vows. Do them however you want. Just understand this. What makes a vow are not the words. It's not the words. You know what makes a vow a vow? What makes a vow a vow 
is a heart that has the intent, intent to live by those words. Then it becomes a vow as you live those words out. And until you do that, they're just words on a piece of paper. Worthless. Worthless. So do your marriage vows. But understand this. If your heart is not motivated to commit to the words that compose, that comprise that vow, worthless. In its pragmatic zeal to partner with the world on matters of social justice and racial reconciliation, the evangelical church today has succeeded only in complicating what the gospel makes very simple. So simple, in fact, that a child can understand it according to Luke 18, 16. That simple gospel is this. Each of us has sinned against a holy God. That's Romans 3, 23. Our sinfulness is congenital. That's Romans 5, 12. Our sin makes us subject to God's wrath. That's John 3, 36. But by faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning and propitiatory work on the cross, sinners like you and me can be reconciled first and foremost to God. And then consequently, consequently, we can be reconciled to one another. That's the gospel simply stated. But see, when the simple message of the gospel is integrated and interwoven with worldly philosophies and ideologies such as liberation theology, the social gospel, the Marxist worldview that, is, that undergirds critical race theory and intersectionality, the gospel loses that simplicity. Consequently, it becomes nothing more than an obscure humanistic proposition of moral and ethical rules that center on mankind trying to save himself. That's the most silly aspect of what we're seeing in the culture right now. The culture believes that it can save itself from itself. Gun control. It's an oxymoron. How are you going to control an inanimate object? I'm convinced that the failure on the part of the professing evangelical believers to embrace a proper biblical anthropology, which is to say a biblical understanding of the innately sinful condition of mankind, is precisely why so many professing Christians today believe as if skin color were dynamic and not static. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. That kind of misplaced thinking is totally contrary to what the scriptures declare about the innate depravity of the human heart. To view melanin as dynamic and not static, is to believe that skin color in and of itself possesses the inherent and autonomous capacity and ability to somehow cause a person to form sinful attitudes, prejudices, and biases about someone. Such misplaced reasoning is why I wholeheartedly reject the term racial reconciliation. I totally reject that term. Listen, races don't reconcile, hearts do. Did you hear me? Racial reconciliation is a non sequitur. It's an oxymoron. Listen, your melanin does not feel, it does not think, it does not love, it does not hate, it does not form intent, whether for good or ill, nor can it comprehend, discern, or distinguish between good and evil. Your melanin doesn't do any of that. <coughs> so how can this reconcile? Because, you know, that's how the culture defines race. They look at your skin color and they say, oh, you're white or you're black. See, that hat is black. This is white. But that's what the culture does. That's why we have to reject these terms. We have to reject the vernacular of the culture. Your melanin does none of those things because it cannot do any of those things. To argue otherwise is to deny what Jesus clearly declared in the passage I just read earlier in Mark chapter 7. That the genesis of all disharmony and disunity that exists in the world, not only today but throughout human history, is a direct byproduct of the sin nature that indwells each one of us. <clears throat> Racial reconciliation. It's a joke. It doesn't even make sense. As believers, our collective failure to apply what is taught by Christ himself in Mark chapter 7 is what has given rise to a doctrine that I've termed sin by proxy. You heard Virgil allude to this earlier. 
as it relates to specifically to the concept of racial reconciliation, sin by proxy is the unbiblical idea that this present generation of white people should be regarded as collectively guilty of historical sins and, and grievances allegedly perpetrated by their ancestors against black people, particularly with regard to slavery, solely on the basis of their ethnicity. You recall one of the five reasons why critical race theory is unbiblical is that it imparts guilt to image bearers of God solely on the basis of the color of their skin. This is what sin by proxy does. So in addition to you being guilty by virtue of your skin color, you must also collectively repent of that sin and then make reparations for those alleged presumed offenses. By the way, on the matter of slavery, especially slavery in America, those of you who are listeners to the Just Thinking podcast, you've heard me say this before. If you ever were to visit Valencia, California, come by the offices of grace to you. I would love to give you a tour of the building, show you around. Maybe John will even be there <clears throat> when you show up. But if you were to come into my office, that's where my library of, of books is. You will find that I have more books in my personal library on slavery than any other topic other than theology. I've studied slavery for years. I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I know a little something, something <laughs> about it. What wokeism does, woke is, it's like I said earlier in my first message, slavery is one issue, one way that, that the woke try to re-problematize things. So they'll reach back 400 years. It's always 400 years. America's been 400 years of guilt, 400 years. America's not even 400 years old. So how, how are you going to say America was? And I'm, I'm pretty dogmatic about this. Don't approach me when to talk about slavery and you want to begin in 1619 Jamestown, Virginia. Don't do that. You got to go a couple thousand years back. I stand before you at this podium as a descendant of slave owners. I got both sides going. <clears throat> One side of the family I, I have, have their roots in slavery the, as slaves. The other side of the family, I got slave owners. My wife, Melissa, right now, she's in the process of doing a really in-depth research of our, but, but her genealogy and mine on Ancestry.com, and just a couple weeks ago, she dug up my fifth great-grandfather. His name is John R. Harrison. He resided in Fairfield, South Carolina, Fairfield County, South Carolina. He owned 200, over 260 slaves. We saw the slave manifestos. We saw them. Slaves handed down to him by his father, Reuben Harrison. So... You got people like the 1619, who's, who's ever heard of the 1619 Project? <clears throat> oh, a lot of you have. See, that project is really named incorrectly. <clears throat> but, but again, that's that narratology. The narrative of uh, people like the, the, the woman who heads up the 1619 Project, their chronology of slavery always starts at 1619. And I've always, I've always argued that what we really need is a 1618 Project. Meaning, we need to, if you really want to talk, have an intellectually honest conversation about slavery, you need to start way before 1619. You need to start 1618 and go all the way back a couple thousand years. Because there would have been no slavery in America, were it not for black Africans who willingly participated in the transatlantic slave trade to deport those slaves from West Africa onto North American shores. Listen to what Dr. Uh, David Eltis and David Richardson say in their book titled Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade, just to make that point. Quoting, the strength and capacity of most West Africans bring us to a subject that is both surprising and upsetting to many uninformed readers. That burger man was... <laughs> it was good, but <laughs> didn't agree with me apparently. The strength and capacity of most West African nations brings us to a subject that is both surprising and upsetting to many uninformed readers, namely the indispensable, listen to this, 
the indispensable complicity of Africans in creating and maintaining the slave trade. Even in the earliest history of the trade, the Portuguese discovered the extreme hazards and counterproductivity of trying to capture and enslave West Africans on their own. West Africans could and did attack and sink some European ships in retaliation. The rulers of Congo, Benin, and some other regions succeeded at times in temporarily stopping the, slave, the trade in slaves. Yet the crucial point was the eagerness of African rulers and merchants to sell slaves. Similarly, similarity rather, in skin color and other bodily traits as Europeans view them, brought African rulers no sense of a common African identity with the captives sold. Let me pause here and say, so what he's saying here is a point I made earlier, that the idea of black community is a myth. Even going all the way back to the transatlantic slave trade in Africa, <clears throat> these African rulers didn't care that their, uh, the, the people they were selling in the slaves looked like them. They didn't care. They did not care. European ships, European ship captains soon discovered the need to present ceremonial gifts to African rulers, to pay fees and taxes, even to anchor their ships and engage in trade, and to employ black interpreters who went ashore with the ship's captain to haggle and bargain with local rulers over the price of slaves. So don't come to me telling me that slavery was just a white person thing. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Mm -mm. There would have been no slavery on the shores if it weren't for people who look like me. But see, they don't want to talk about that. Reparations. What? 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 What does the reparation is? How does he handle someone like me? You pay me reparations over here because on my mom's side of the family, yep, there were slaves. But over here, you take the reparations back because on my dad's side of the family, they sold the slaves. So I'm a net zero. I'm a zero sum. I'm, I'm, I, I get nothing. I told you it doesn't pay to be black like Virgil and I are, are black. It, it, it doesn't pay. Is this idea of sin by proxy that has fueled and fed the propagation of such unbiblical philosophies as white guilt and white fragility, even within the church, so much so that many white evangelical Christians have chosen to remain in the closet, so to speak, for fear of being labeled racist for saying anything that might even be remotely construed as going against the current social justice narrative. And that narrative is to portray all black people as oppressed and all white people as oppressors. But the prejudicial feelings and sentiments that you and I hold toward each other is a direct and tangible byproduct of the enmity that resides in our hearts towards God. It's a reality that is affirmed by the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 7, where he says that the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And yet, despite that truth, the false gospel of racial reconciliation continues to be preached from the pulpits of many evangelical churches today. But you see, nowhere in Scripture is the term race used in the same context as it is consistently employed today by the culture. Now, hear what I didn't say. What I didn't say is that you won't find the word race in the Bible. Yeah, you'll find that word there. But when you exposit and exegete that word, you understand that it's not the same context in which the culture uses the term. <clears throat> it's like I said this morning. Race is a social construct to the culture. In the Bible where you see the word race, it's not used. That's not the same definition. In April 2018, National Geographic published a special issue titled The Race Issue. April 2018, you can go online and search for this. National Geographic special issue titled The Race Issue. <clears throat> in that special issue, there was an article included, and the title of that article was 
There's no scientific basis for race. It's a made-up label. It's the National Geographic. Now, you usually expect National Geographic to concentrate on animals. And, but they nailed it with this one. November 2018. I'm sorry, April 2018. There is no scientific basis for race. It's a made-up label. And in that article was included a very important yet little-known fact about a man whose name you heard Virgil mention earlier, Dr. Samuel Morton. I'm quoting from that article. In the first half of the 19th century, one of America's most prominent scientists was a doctor named Samuel Morton. Morton lived in Philadelphia, and he collected human skulls. He wasn't choosy about his suppliers. He accepted skulls scavenged from battlefields and snatched from catacombs. One of his most famous craniums belonged to an Irishman who'd been sent as a convict to Tasmania and ultimately hanged for killing and eating other convicts. With each skull, Morton performed the same procedure. Now listen to closely to this, closely to what Morton's procedure was. He stuffed the skull with pepper seeds. Later he switched to lead shot, which he then decanted to ascertain the volume of the brain case. So what would, ha what would happen, Morton would take a human skull, stuff it with pepper seeds to see how much pepper seeds the the, the skull a hole, then he would empty the, the skull of, of what it contained. Morton believed that people could be divided into five races and that these races represented se separate acts of creation. Here's why you need to be a, a better theologian. Because here this guy, Morton, Morton had his own theology. He had his own theology of creation. He believed that there were five separate acts of creation by God to create these five categories of races, which I'm going to describe to you now. Still quoting from the National Geographic article. The races had distinct characters, which corresponded to their place in, a, in what Morton believed was a divinely determined hierarchy. So Morton argued that this is God's providential order of, of the species of humanity. Morton's craniometry showed, he claimed, that whites or Caucasian, were the most intelligent of the races. Again, because the cranium uh, of a Caucasian person held more pepper seed. <laughs> Morton's craniometry showed he claimed that whites or Caucasians were the most intelligent of the races. East Asians, Morton used the term Mongolian, though ingenious, he said, and susceptible of cultivation, were one step down. Next came Southeast Asians, followed by Native Americans. Blacks, or Ethiopians, as Morton called them, were at the bottom. In the decades before, the, please listen closely to this. In the decades before the Civil War, Morton's ideas were quickly taken up by the defenders of slavery. So you see what believing a lie can lead to. When Morton died in 1851, the Charleston Medical Journal in South Carolina praised him for, quote, giving to the Negro his true position as an inferior race, unquote. Today, Samuel, by the way, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you in here have ever been to Charleston, but if you've uh, not been there and if you ever uh, have an opportunity to go there, please take some time to visit what's called the Old Slave Mart in uh, downtown Charleston, South Carolina. It is... Uh, the actual literal uh, port where slave ships would come in to port in Charleston and, um, and offload their slaves to be auctioned off uh, on that spot. Matter of fact, <clears throat> there's a, a cobblestone street that you would walk down. The slave mart is, well, depending on what direction you're coming from, um, was, is on the left, but there's cobblestone. It's a cobblestone street from one end to the other. Those cobblestones actually come uh, from actual slave ships from a couple hundred years ago that they used those stones to balance the, the weight of the ship out. So if you're ever in Charleston, take some time to go by the, uh, the old slave mart. It's definitely a, an impactful uh, experience. But when Morton died in 1851, the Charleston Medical Journal in South Carolina, you, you, I read what they said, that, that <clears throat> they praised Morton for giving the Negro his true position 
as an inferior race. Today, Samuel Morton is known as the father of scientific racism. Another word for scientific racism is Darwinism. Is Darwinism. So many of the horrors of the past few centuries can be traced to the idea that one race is inferior to another, that a tour of his collection is a haunting experience. To an uncomfortable degree, we still live with Morton's legacy. Racial distinctions continue to shape our politics, our neighborhoods, and our sense of self. This is the case even though, listen to this, this is the case even though what science actually has to tell us about race is just the opposite of what Morton contended. It's like Virgil said earlier this morning, if you don't have Acts 17.26 highlighted in your Bible, you need to highlight it. Acts 17.26 is a one-verse apologetic against this kind of worldview. One verse. You don't need another verse. One verse. Acts 17, 26, will debunk the idea of race and totally shut it down. In a commencement address delivered at Western Reserve College in 1854, titled, The Claims of the Negro Ethnologically Considered, <clears throat> the noted abolitionist, author, and educator, and former slave Frederick Douglass, wholeheartedly and unambiguously denounced Dr. Samuel Morton's scientific conclusions. Now, before I read this quote from Douglas, <clears throat> notice here the title of his commencement address. He didn't title this The Claims of the Negro Racially Considered. He titled it, rightly and accurately, The Claims of the Negro Ethnologically Considered. I'm going to read a quote that's excerpted from this address, but if you're taking notes, again, the title is The Claims of the Negro Ethnologically Considered. <clears throat> I would encourage you to go online and read that entire address because in that address, Frederick Douglass uses Acts 1726 to argue the equality of the black man with the white man. And what you'll find is Black abolitionists use the Bible regularly to do that. The Bible is often blamed, especially by critical race theorists, and this was true to some degree. The Bible has been misused over hundreds of years to promote, propagate, and advance unbiblical worldviews like slavery, especially in the South. But the Bible was also used to abolish slavery. Apart from the word of God, slavery would have lasted much, much longer than it did. But Douglas said this about Samuel Morton. <clears throat> he said, common sense is scarcely needed to detect the absence of manhood in a monkey or to recognize its presence in a Negro. His speech, his reason, his power to acquire and to retain knowledge, his heaven erected face, his habitudes, his hopes, his fears, his aspirations, his prophecies plant between him and the brute creation a distinction as eternal as it is palpable. Away, therefore, with all this scientific moonshine that would connect men with monkeys. That's what he thought of Samuel Morton. He thought his craniometry conclusions were scientific moonshine. Away, therefore, with all the scientific moonshine that would connect men with monkeys that would have the world believe that humanity, instead of resting on its own characteristic pedal. Matter of fact, let me say this. Just, just poetic language that Douglas use here, uses here. He said, away with all that scientific moonshine that would have the world believe that humanity, instead of resting on its own characteristic pedal, gloriously independent, is sort of a sliding scale, making one extreme brother, making one extreme brother to the orangutan and the other to angels and all the rest intermediaries. <clears throat> Douglas says that mankind rests on its own characteristic pedestal, gloriously independent. I'm reflecting on Genesis 2. Verse, correct me if I'm wrong on here. <clears throat> But if your translation is correct, where God creates man and woman, 
when Adam says, you shall be called woman, that word there is a capital W. When he goes on to say, you, were, you shall be called woman for you were taken from man. That's a capital M. If your translation reads those words, man and woman, in small letters, that's an incorrect translation. The reason is capital W and capital M is because of Genesis 127. Because God created man in his image. There's not another creature on the face of this earth that God created in his image. This is what Douglas, is, this is what Douglas realizes, that Samuel Morton did not. This is where this poetic language is coming from. It's coming from Genesis 127. Douglas goes on. He says, try by all the usual and all the unusual tests, whether mental, moral, physical, or psychological, the Negro is a man. Considering him as possessing knowledge or needing knowledge, his elevation or his degradation, his virtues or his vices, whichever road you take, you reach the same conclusion. The Negro is a man. His good and his bad, his innocence and his guilt, his joys and his sorrows proclaim his manhood in speech that all mankind practically and readily understand. Unquote. So the idea of human races is a myth. Race is a myth. If you don't hear anything else I'm saying, hear that. Race is a myth. You must reject that term. You must reject it. The proper word, as Douglas rightly understood, is ethnicity. It's ethnic. Not racial. It's ethnic. It's ethnicity. Race is a myth both theologically and scientifically, and I would add biologically. For centuries, society, and sadly to a great extent, the church has unquestioningly, unquestioningly bought into that myth. The resulting damage has been well documented over the annals of both societal and ecclesiastical history, not only in America, but around the world. Man-centered efforts to reconcile people of different ethnicities is nothing new. And yet, invariably, those efforts have proven futile in ameliorating what is the root cause of the enmity that exists between human beings. And that root cause is the sin that dwells in us. I laugh my head off when I see people on CNN saying, well, we need to have a conversation about race. No, we don't. No, we don't. We need to have a conversation about the sin in the human heart. That's a conversation we need to have. See, by definition, reconciliation is a volitional act that occurs at the level of the human heart. And if I make, a, make another biblical counseling note here, this is what my wife and I do when we bring uh, two people together, a husband and wife, or in premarital counsel, we bring a fian two fiancés together. What you're doing is you're bringing two hearts together, is what you're doing. That's really what you're doing. The only question is, are either of you going to be willing to humble yourself enough to come out of here reconciled? Reconciliation is a volitional act. It's a volitional act. Skin color plays no role whatsoever. None. This is static. It's not dynamic. It's static. Only the regenerative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ can alone turn our stony hearts to hearts of flesh. That's Ezekiel 36. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can remedy what separates us both from God and from one another. I mean, think about this. <clears throat> think about this. Apart from the gospel, how can, it, how can it be understood? Apart from the gospel, and apart what the gospel says about the congenital condition of our heart, that it is sinful from conception, apart from that, how can it be understood how something as innocuous and fixed as the color of someone's skin can be observed with our eyes, processed in our mind, and formed as sinfully prejudicial attitudes in our heart. How can you explain that? How can I look at my guy squirrel right here? I'm observing the color of his skin with my eyes. 
I process what I observe in my mind. How does it get from here to here? See, only the gospel explains that. There's no other explanation other than the gospel. I wholly concur with what Pastor John MacArthur says. He says, as Christians, we ought to have a moral and social influence in our communities. We ought to use the rights granted to us to promote morality and decency in the public arena. But that's not the sum total of our responsibility to this world. We can't settle for mere social change and behavior modification. We must bring the light of the truth to bear in a world blinded by sin. And we must do what we can to halt society's decay, not through protest and political action, but through the bold proclamation of the gospel, unquote. But see, the culture doesn't want that to be the problem because that doesn't get them what they want. Jupiter Hammond, who lived his entire life as a slave, is now a free man. He's eternally free. You see, but the truth is, Hammond was already a free man even in the midst of his earthly enslavement. See, are you, are, some of us in this room aren't as free as Hammond was when he was a slave. Some of us aren't even that free right now. We're not chained. But in your heart, in your mind, you're not free. You're more enslaved than he was. The gospel of Jesus Christ frees us to rest in the reality that the same God who spoke into existence the heavens and the earth is in complete control of everything that incurs in it. Everything. Those of you who listen to Virgil and me on the, on the podcast, you know <clears throat> this is my favorite verse in the entire Bible. Ecclesiastes 7.14. Ecclesiastes 7.14, in the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, remember that the Lord created the one as well as the other. I promise you, if you can get that verse into your mind and heart, you will never have a bad day. Never. You will never, ever. I don't care what's going on. Ecclesiastes 7.14, in the day of prosperity, when things are going well, be happy. Celebrate. But when things aren't going well, you need to remind yourself that the Lord created that good day as well as that bad day. See, that's what, that's what Hammond believed for 95 years. That God is sovereign over everything, the blessings and the adversity. If you can get that up here, I promise you, you will never have a bad day. Never. Cornelius Van Til, who lived from 1895 to 1987, <clears throat> said this in his book on Christian apologetics. Quote, he says, I feel that the whole of history and civilization would be unintelligible to me if it were not for my belief in God. So true, so true is this that I propose to argue that unless God is behind everything, you cannot find meaning in anything. Now, as I prepare to close, I want to shift gears for a moment and say a word about justice because we hear stuff, <clears throat> hear stuff incessantly about justice, 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 blah, blah, blah. There's an old maxim that says justice delayed is justice denied. Who's heard, of, who's heard of that before? Justice delayed is justice denied. Well, those words could not be more wrong in terms of what Scripture teaches. As far as God is concerned, justice is neither delayed nor denied. God has promised that his holy, righteous, and impartial judgment will be meted out to those deserving other of it either in this life or in the next. I want you to make a note of one verse, 1 Timothy 5.24. This is a one-verse biblical theology of justice. One verse. One verse biblical theology of justice. It says, for some, their sins will be judged in this life. But for others, their sins are going to be judged after. 
This is why I can accept <clears throat> what is happening in the culture, knowing that a sovereign God is going to judge wrongdoing. He's going to judge injustice. If someone was murdered unjustly, he's going to judge that. If someone has something stolen from them unjustly, if a spouse was hurt by an adulterous spouse who left them without biblical reason, God's going to judge that. He's going to do it either in this life or in the next one. But there, listen, hear me clearly on this. Injustice is not non-justice. That's what 1 Timothy 5.24 is teaching us. Injustice is not non-justice. That's what the culture wants you to believe. So this, this is what gave rise to Black Lives Matter because they thought the Trayvon Martin trial was an injustice because George Zimmerman was acquitted. <clears throat> oh, it's an injustice. Injustice is never non-justice. That said, it is naive for us to expect perfect justice in a world that is inherently imperfect. Justice is never perfect when left to the determination of sinners like you and me. It's imperfect because of enmity, not ethnicity. Scripture is clear that the world in which we live rests in the power of the evil one. That's 1 John 5.19. Ecclesiastes 5.8 says, If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. Crooked politicians, Ecclesiastes 5.8, got that covered. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He did not come into the world to save society. The culture's view of racial reconciliation fails to realize that our need for reconciliation is rooted in the enmity that exists between us and God. And society cannot hope to remedy with temporal solutions what is fundamentally a spiritual malady. The only solution is what Jesus himself preached. You must be born again. Thank you all very much. We are for a break, Jim. Ten minute break. All right, thank you. Praise the Lord, oh, praise his name. From the heights of heaven he reigns. Seated in the highest place. Surrounded by an ending praise Reason for his mighty deeds Awesome in his majesty Praise him now with trumpet sound Lift your voice and dance around Everything that has breath Praise the Lord Everything that's in us Praise him Excellence. Look at what he's done for us. Bore our sins upon the cross. Praise the Lord with all you are. Mind and soul and will and heart. From his hand comes everything. He alone is God.
What up, V Dog? Come on, bro. You go, you're gonna learn about taking those yeah. red eyes. All right, if you wanna come on inside and have a seat. All right, uh, our very first question is, we need you guys to approve a design. Oh my God. Uh oh. <laughs> I like that. Oh, no. yeah. I like that. All right. Let's get it. You couldn't get your design guy on it, so I got my design guy yeah. on it. Man. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so that will be available at the church website. <laughs> Man, if you did that. <laughs> You talk about people coming at you. Only thing missing is the reference to Acts 17, 26. That's the only thing missing to give it context. We'll have that by the end of the session. Yeah, you got that. <laughs> Way to go, Jim. I like that. All right. Yeah. All right, first question. I'm going to try and go through the ones that we've got from the audience here so far. You can take that down. You don't need to get that. <laughs> Somebody's probably taking a picture and then shout it out on social. It'll be a whole nother <clears throat> issue tomorrow when you, you come You guys in. can deal with that? Yeah. We can handle it. We can handle it. Right, from your book about the state, your chapter on elections and going into the voting booth with a biblical worldview was absolutely relevant. I used the information talking with others over and over. Have you thought of printing this in a way that we can hand it out to people to educate them before elections? Oh, well, uh, we have uh, the, the actual episode that, 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 that was the catalyst for the chapter. One of the things that we did as a, as a part of the process to putting the book together, we, we actually took the sections from the, um, our tr we started with the transcripts from the, uh, the, the actual episodes. And then from that, we would build out whatever we needed and then would edit it and, and make sure that it read in a way that you weren't reading the podcast, but that you were reading a book as if you were sitting down and we were talking directly to you. So the, the, the goal of the process was for to to, to look like that, sound like that, read like that. And for the most part, I think um, between us and the editor, they, they did a fantastic job. It was a kind of collaborative effort. If you want to take that portion separately and give it to someone, I would just encourage you to do that. I mean, you could go back and, and actually get the episode. I don't remember what number it was. Like yeah, I don't remember what number episode or, that was. I'll look it up. I'll look it up. 105. 105. I would just get that. That you knows your podcast better yeah. than you guys do. I, <laughs> would just, I would just go grab that episode and send it to someone for them to listen to and think about separately uh, so that you don't have to buy the whole book. But yeah, I, would also the, encourage, I would also encourage <clears throat> the purchase of the book because it is a, it, it, it's a compendium of information that will be helpful year after year after year. We, we, we wrote it so that it could be a resource uh, for someone to use over and over. We had a, uh, a conversation with, with one of the, the, um, the, the, the folks who, who put, the publisher who put the book together. They said, well, here's what sales are doing. Da, da, da. My thought is every election cycle with regard to this book, you should see a, a spike in sales as people begin to think about how should I think about this issue or that issue biblically? And, and the hope would be that they would pick up that book and it would be helpful. Yeah, I was just going to mention real quick. In the book, the chapter is titled just Elections. But on the podcast, the episode is titled The Doctrine of Elections. Uh, but they shortened the title of it in the book, uh, the table of contents. But if you're going to go listen to the episode, it's episode 105. But the title is The Doctrine of Elections. Yeah. Do you Question. want to tell a little bit about what we covered in that? I mean, the reason I mentioned that is simply because uh, if, if you are reformed and you hear Doctrine of Elections, you're, you're actually thinking about soteriology. 
right? And that's not what we cover. Uh, it is actually about a play on words. Yeah, it's a play on that. It's a play on the words, and, and the thought process is, you know, what what kind of a worldview do we need to have as we go into the election booth? What kinds of things should we be thinking about? How should we be thinking about issues biblically speaking as we approach an election? The election. Yeah, that episode is like a three-hour biblical primer on how to vote. And what I'm most proud of in the work that we, Virgil and I did in that episode is that we went three hours. We didn't name a single political candidate by name, and we don't mention a single political party by name. But we give you three hours of biblical precepts and principles, uh, which we hope would encourage you to, to go into the voting booth with a biblical worldview uh, so as to not be, a, so we wouldn't be in the position of being accused of being biased or whatever. Uh, we don't mention any candidate by name, no political party by name, and three hours worth of content. So that episode is evergreen, as Virgil just said. Uh, and, and, you know, coming up on a, a minor or major election cycle, you should send that episode out to everyone you know Absolutely. and have them listen to it. That would be helpful. All right, the amount of material, resources, and books that you two read for your podcast is immense. How do you find time to do that research, and how do you schedule that in? One of the reasons why we don't do the podcast every week is for that very reason. Um, and and Daryl can walk through a little bit of how we uh, process each subject. But every time we, we begin a, a portion of the research, we've just got to do it as we go. We have to consider, okay, we've got travel schedules, uh, we've got work. We've got day jobs. Uh, yeah, we've got, we got day families. jobs that we've we got to take care of. So we really are, are processing all of those things. And we won't, we won't do an episode until we feel like we've fully vetted the, the, um, the, the, the subject. One of the things that really caused, I think, an, an, an elevation or an increase in, uh, in, in the amount of research that goes into each episode for, for me at least, and Daryl could speak to this himself, it was who was listening. It was who was listening, right? Initially, it was just me and Daryl, we were having a good time, maybe a couple hundred people, but when it gets to 10,000 and then 20,000 and then a 50,000 episode and then a 80,000 and then a 100,000 plus, I'm thinking, that's a whole lot of folks who are listening. And, and many of them, while many of them are, are, are favorable uh, to what we say and do, there are a number of them who are not. Can I, can I interject real quick right here? Speaking of, speaking of a number of them that are not, it's not a large number, but the small number, there's a small number. What I, I'm recalling right now for uh, uh, a person who shall remain anonymous. They left us a, rev a negative review on uh, Apple iTunes, on Apple Podcasts. They left us a negative review. They accused us of being too articulate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. That review said we were too articulate. He gave us a one star. Yeah. One star out of five because he said we were too articulate. So, was it Joe Biden? He once said yeah. Barack Obama. <laughs> it's clean and clean. clean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so we, as we begin thinking about who's listening, it's imperative that we get things right. And and Daryl spoke to this earlier. That's important to us, right? If, if I'm if I'm quoting something to you from uh, someone who's uh, who has a different worldview, I want to be honest about uh, about what they're saying, what they're doing, how they're believing. And so again, you'll hear us try to quote from original resource material because we wanna be accurate in what's mm -hmm. said. And, and doing that takes time. It's more than just a quick Google search and you got it and, and pop and go. Um, you've gotta buy these books at times and read through them and unpack them. So that takes time. So our hope is that with each episode, you come away feeling like, wow, if I hadn't listened to that, there's no way I would have had the time uh, to go research that and know that apart from these guys spending the time, taking the time and dissecting it uh, for us and then pushing whatever the issue is through a biblical worldview. And so that's kind of, that's kind of the, the, the thought process. It, it takes a while. Uh, right now, we're, we, we, we're, we're trying to average about one episode per month. And I think this is the first time that it's going to be a little bit of... It's going to be a little bit delayed space. because of our travel schedule for the month of June. So we have to push the next episode out to the middle of July. Yeah. yeah. But to just give you guys some background, the verse kind of alluded, uh, alluded to this, give you guys some background on, on about how we, how we do what we do. <clears throat> Usually, th th there's nothing scientific or complicated about it. If there's a, a topic or an issue or a theme that's burdening one of our hearts, we'll just send a text, me text message. Out and uh, like Virgil, for instance, for the episode that's coming up, the one that we're going to be releasing in middle middle of July, is uh, titled "Cultural Denominationalism." Virgil sends me a text and uh, says, "Hey, I think we should do one on, on denominationalism," and I texted back. I said, "Political denominationalism," 
He said, yeah. Then I, a couple days later, I was dwelling on that. I said, no, nah, political denominationalism is too narrow. I said, what about cultural denominationalism? He said, let's do it. So I got to work. Uh, so that's usually how we agree on a topic or, or, or an issue for an episode. It's just a couple of text messages, maybe a phone call it's real quick. We'll nail it down after a few seconds. And then that's my cue to go get to work. Mm -hmm. For this upcoming episode, episode 119, on cultural denominationalism, if you want to make a note, we're tentatively, tentatively scheduling that release uh, for July 13th, Wednesday, July 13th. I went out and bought 12 books on denominationalism uh, to study and prepare uh, for this episode. So Virgil's right. Uh, we invest a lot of, uh, uh, not just time, but a lot of our own resources uh, financially to, pr to prepare for these episodes, to, to rightly divide the word of truth up against these topics. So I went on and ordered 12 books on Amazon. Uh, what you're going to hear me, I'm done with my preparation for that episode, but Virgil is just now beginning his. I think I emailed Virgil like 15 pages of notes. <coughs> Um, is on, that what that, on, was? that was? Yeah, that's what, that's what that email was. Oh, you might want to open that email, bro. You might want to open that one. So yeah, so I emailed Virgil 15 pages of notes on my end. Uh, um, from my side, I'm quoting 17 different theologians in that episode, just from the reading that I've done. So now Virgil's getting to work on, on his end. And what happens is, is when I send Virgil my notes, we both develop our content in manuscript form. So every word you hear when you press play is written down. It's in, it's in manuscript form. We have every single word written down. And as I prepare my notes, I have places within my commentary where Virgil will come in, mm -hmm. okay? So when I send him my notes, he sees what my thesis is, he sees what my argument is, and he sees where he needs to come in. That's why you never hear us talking over one another, because I've got designated spaces for him to come in. Now, we have moments where we ad lib and kind of go off of our notes uh, periodically, but for the most part, <clears throat> all that stuff is structured. So when I send my notes uh, to Virgil, Virgil knows, okay, now it's time for him to get to work. However much time he thinks he may need, that we will build that time into the date that we're gonna release the episode. So I just emailed, me, emailed my notes to him last week I'm thinking Verge probably needs about three weeks mm -hmm. to get ready. <clears throat> so we built that three weeks in. I'll text Verge. I said, okay, Verge, for this three weeks that you may need, I think that puts us out. Maybe we can record the episode on July 9th. What do you think? He'll look at his calendar. Boom. Okay, we're good. All right, got it. We set the record date. We set the record time. The release date is always the following Wednesday. So we're going to record this episode on July 9th. It's going to be released on July 13th. And, and, and the cool thing about it is that when I send Virgil my notes, he sees what I'm going to say. But he never sends me his notes. <laughs> he never sends, I never know, when we hit record on that scheduled date and time, I never know what he's going to say. Yeah. Never. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> there, there's a reason for that. Uh, there's a couple of dynamics that are happening when I get his notes. He's got a very methodical, thought-out process. And, and usually, he already told you, he's got 17 different quotes in the, in, you know, 17 different theologians alone that he's quoting. In order to maintain some fluidity, I can't come back in with, with 20 more quotes, right? In order to maintain fluidity, I've got to think through where he's going and what I need to do to help you breathe when you hear that uh, podcast. When, you, when he comes with a, with a quote that's, you know, a paragraph long, I've got to think, okay, do I need to help them process what was just said? Are there points that were made that I need to reiterate? Or is there a completely different direction that I need to take so that it can illuminate what's taken place? And so while I didn't do this early on, and I, I, was, I kicked myself for not doing it, when, early on when we started, I would, my, my, he told you he's the writer, I'm not the writer. I would use bullet points. So I would bullet point my ideas and just kind of be very extemporaneous, which was great, and it helped, the, you know, it helped with the flow of, of, and continuity of our conversation. The problem with it became uh, when we started taking our uh, transcripts and putting them into manuscript form for preparation for a book, right? So the first book, they're like, where are your notes? And I said, oh, they're bullet points. So we can't, I mean, what's the bullet point going to do for that, right? 
So we had to go back through and then manuscript things. So, so that, that, was, that took a lot longer to get the first book out. But the, the other piece of it is I, I, I try, once I get his notes, to think of a different direction that he's not seeing or thinking. And for the most part, uh, I try to operate in, in a pastoral framework. Um, yeah, I'm the more prophetic voice of the two, so I'm Dar always hitting the, the, the truth aspect. Daryl is going gonna, is gonna to hit you with truth real hard in your face, and I, and I try to think about it through a pastoral lens. How can I not soften the truth, but, but frame it in a way that, that helps bring someone along for where we're going? So he's got the application piece. Yeah. Okay, so I'm the doctrine guy. He's the application piece of it. You, you hear that distinctly in our... Uh, most recent episode on a biblical response to perfectionism, where it's, it's, it's a three-hour biblical counseling session. So if, if you know anyone who's dealing with the sin of perfectionism in their life, you want to turn them on to that episode. It's a three-hour biblical counseling session on perfectionism where, I, where you hear our distinct uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, I'm more prophetic. This guy right here is more uh, pastoral, more application. Uh, but uh, we, we warn people at the top of that episode that this is not going to be a comfortable episode for you to listen to if you're dealing with that issue in your life because like any biblical counseling session, you're, you're trying to identify what the heart issue is. Because, and perfectionism is no different. There's a heart issue at play here that you need to identify and deal with. So we walk you through that, but you hear our distinct voices as you, as you listen La to that. Last so. thing I'll say about this, and then we'll get back to more of the questions. Is, is there's a, a, if you're thinking about podcasts or doing a podcast and, and or listening to us and kind of are thinking about what's the secret sauce, I don't know that there is any. Um, I will simply say, um, he, I've always thought of our partnership and Daryl's been gracious. Daryl Darryl has, <clears throat> Darryl has never said, well, you, you only get so much time or I gotta make sure, it, there's ne that, that, that never <laughs> happens. Uh, Daryl, when, when, we, when we turn the microphones on, he can't wait to hear what I'm gonna say and I know what he's going to say, but I can't wait to hear him deliver what he's going to say. And so there's still that mutual, um, just kind of effervescent kind of joy to, to hearing two brothers talk about things. But in my mind, just so that you know, I try to think whatever he's delivered, I need to be about 40% of that. So I'm thinking when I'm preparing 60, 40, 60% of his voice needs to be heard. 40% of mine needs to be heard as a co-host. Some people do 80-20, some people do 90-10. I try to balance it about in that, that range. So if I see he's, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll do a word count. If I'm gonna manuscript, I'll do a word count. I'll see, okay, in that section, uh, he had a thousand words. Okay, whatever I say needs to come in at 600. So I've literally done that at times to just make sure that, that, that there's a balance of, of matching. That's probably way more than you ever wanted to know about that. But. All right, we, we don't have three hours to get through the rest sorry, of this. Sorry, brother. I'm sorry. <laughs> you boys need to pick up the pace. I'm sorry. Yeah, All right, yeah. here we go. Why do you think the New Testament does not directly address slavery as a sin? It does address it. It does address it. It directly addresses it. Um, Virg, you may be better to, to, to respond to this question than me, but I think the question gets into the area of, uh, you know, Bible study methods, how do you go about Bible studying the Bible? How do you go about uh, the process of hermeneutics? How do you deal with exegesis, mm -hmm. exposition, and things of that nature? Because fundamentally, I think that's, the, that's what the question gets to. The, 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 the Bible does uh, directly address slavery, and it addresses it as a sin issue. So the, the, question, uh, the question needs to be reframed, because the issue isn't slavery, the issue is the sin that leads to slavery, that led to slavery. So you, you, you have to root cause, what you're, what, you're, what you're dealing with in that question is the, the fruit of the root. And you need to deal with the root. Yeah. You need to deal with the root. Um, the Bible, from cover to cover, directly addresses slavery. Now because you don't see in Exodus 20, thou shalt not commit slavery, that doesn't mean the Bible doesn't address it. The Bible does address it. It's a sin issue. And if the Bible does anything, nothing else, it addresses the sin in our hearts. I, I tried to, to address that in the message that I just gave, um, in that section where, you know, talking about Jupiter Hammond, talking about, um, uh, uh, quoting from uh, David Eltis in the Atlas of the Transatlantic Slave Trade, sharing my own uh, ancestral um, 
uh, realities with, uh, with, with slaves and slavery. But yeah, the New Testament does address directly slavery because it addresses the sin issue that resulted mm-hmm. in that sin. And, uh, and I think, Virgil, I think it was you who said uh, at some point uh, today, <clears throat> slavery has been a global issue for thousands of years. Yeah. It's going on right now as we sit here. So slavery has not been uh, uh, eliminated uh, throughout the world. But the New Testament does address it, and so does the Old Testament, by the way. Um, I think our culture is so reactionary. We're so emotional. We're so sentimental. Where when we hear words like slavery, we automatically default to an Uncle Tom situation. When we think of somebody being whipped or beating or beaten or abused, and there definitely was that. But the thing about scripture when it comes to slavery, when you look at it, the Bible doesn't outlaw slavery. It doesn't prohibit it. What it prohibits is the maltreatment of your slaves. Um, Historically, slavery was, I don't care if you want to call it slavery or servitude, whatever word you want to use. In many cases, those situations were the only opportunities for many men and, and women and children to maintain a standard of living so that they could remain alive. They weren't employable in certain occupations or jobs or things like that because they weren't skilled. <clears throat> um, those cases were rare, but we've got we, we, we've to remove ourselves from these default reactionary responses to where when we hear the word slavery, we think only on the worst case scenarios. Not all sla- Matter of fact, most slavery was not that. So the Bible addresses the maltreatment of your slaves because even slaves were image bearers of God. Uh, so, um, you know, that question is a very, um, it's a very important question, but the question itself needs to be exegeted a little bit to get the context. I would, I would add a couple of things to that quickly, and I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I, I, I watch for time. Two things. One is the Old Testament actually does deal with it directly from a standpoint of, of man stealing, right? You have that kind of KJV language, Exodus 20. It, it's, it, it really forbids uh, the stealing. And, and what you're talking about with, with chattel slavery, particularly here in the United States, and what that looked like, that, were, that was people who went into a land, stole a man, brought him here, put him in chains, and enslaved him. The issue of, of slavery uh, in, in the Old Testament, when you see culturally speaking, people sold themselves uh, in, in, in the indentured servitude mm-hmm. uh, in the Old Testament. It was a very natural part of, of, the, uh, of the culture of the time. And so we have only one view of slavery, and that's what blacks experienced here in the United States of America. Uh, you also have uh, 1 Timothy uh, 1.10, uh, that where, where Paul, in, in writing to Timothy, actually uh, calls slave traders immoral. These same slave traders would be the ones that are kind of looked at in the Old Testament as man-stealers. So the, the, the text does address uh, the, the nature of, of what we would talk about here in America as, as chattel slavery, uh, the, the manner in which it, w- it was encountered. But the, but the point of, of Scripture wasn't to clear up slavery. The point of scripture was a, a story about, about a, a sovereign God who would send his son to redeem mankind and, and, and save us from the, from the true slavery that would lead to eternal death in hell. And so as a result of that, that message is the message that's focused upon and, and with the hope that people's hearts will be transformed by the power of that gospel and they will engage in things that dehumanize other image bearers of God. Finally, I'll say this, you've got the, the, uh, the, the book of uh, Philemon or, or the story of rather Philemon, at, at, who was a slave leaves and Paul tells him to, to go back and tells the, 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 the slave and the slave master how to, how to engage one another. So you have Christianity being the first of a worldview that tells slave and slave owner that they are brothers in Christ Equals. and need to treat one another in that manner. So there's all kinds of things that you can look at from the text. I think that the point that Daryl is, is making is it, it takes someone responsibly exegeting the text, unpacking it, for the clarity of truth that's therein. So I hope that helps. Yeah, okay, now as we see more and more men whom are once trusted, and we're gonna talk about this more in just a moment, begin to sort of go off the beam, head in a trajectory that makes us uncomfortable. If a pastor or author that you have read and heard turns to embrace an unbiblical idea, at what point do you abandon any helpful materials that they have produced? Man. Because yeah, we got guys that have produced good materials, yep. sometimes volumes produced by ministries, yep. and now they're wavering on some of these issues, yep. embracing it. Yep. 
what point do we just walk away from it and and turn our nose up? At yeah, it? I, I think I think there, I, I think that's a challenging question because I think there are categories for these kinds of things, right? I, I, and again, I I don't want to I'm going to share with you kind of how I view this, but I wouldn't prescribe this as hey, follow, here's what I do, follow me, right? Because there's there's still aspects of this that I'm working out. A, a similar question that, that Daryl and I were asking as we watched the whole woke thing unfold is when do we begin calling these people, these, these men who, mm-hmm. who have been, tra- when do we begin, we begin calling them unbelievers, right? When they're preaching a different gospel, they're, they're, they're advocating ideas that are anti-biblical and they're embracing a, 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 a worldview that, that doesn't match what scripture is taught. When, when do we finally challenge it and say they're unbelievers? And so- That's what, that's what Galatians is all about. I think I think that's I think that's challenging. So, the the way I kind of view that, I, I I'll give you an example of what I what what I demonstrated here. Okay, today when I gave my talk, I quoted who Dr. Martin Luther King, right? Uh, trusted hero and, and and really an iconic figure. Uh, but I I said we should we should have problems with his theology, mm-hmm. right? Uh, because it was off, it was wrong. I even went so far as to say I don't believe that Martin Luther King was a, was a Christian, but under the umbrella of common grace, whether believer or not believer, you can speak truth about, about an issue, a, 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 a situation, a circumstance. You can speak that truth and we can advocate that truth as something that, that it coincides with the biblical worldview while, while identifying the wrongness of that man. I think I would, in light of a, of a believer, a man that we've trusted, I would do the same kind of thing. I would say, listen, Here's someone who, who has maybe some good material. I, I, at, this, at the point at which they've gone off the rail, I don't um, promote their works. I would not promote, uh, you would not see me advocate, hey, go, go buy this, hey, go, 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 <clears throat> for the purpose of your own, our own soul's protection. I would not advocate doing that. I would simply say that, that you know, this person has written some good material. If you came to me and asked me, and that's usually the, how, yeah. how this happens. This is not a, I'm on a, 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 a Facebook page or a, or a live and I'm telling you uh, about, uh, uh, w- w- let's just call it out. I'm not telling you about n- nine marks of a healthy church. On a on a on a on a Facebook post or in some space and place because I I know what 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 Dever now where he is what he stands for what what he's promoting in the way of of a of a gospel that's that that that's tainted right uh, and and by that what I mean is simply the the the, the wokeism that's invaded things at Capitol Hill uh, what he's allowed to take place in that space and I've got the quotes and can do all of that but I just I I personally would not promote that work in an open space I would not. Now, if someone were to come to me with the book and say, is this a good book? Should I be reading this? Mm-hmm. I would say, listen, you're free to read what you want. However, here's where this man is in error. Here's where some things are wrong. And you need to be aware of that and know that for your own soul's yeah. safety. So that would be the manner in which I would, I would operate that. Again, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't prescribe that. Uh, I'm just telling you how I navigate that very challenging and difficult issue. Yeah, I will just add... Uh, I'm sorry, people, when you brought up Dr. King, it just occurred to me, any of you who are interested in reading and studying Dr. King's um, theological worldview or his worldview in general, you can do a Google search. Just, just search Martin Luther King Jr. Stanford University. Stanford University has a partnership with the King Center in Atlanta where you have many of Dr. King's papers online at Stanford University website. Many of his papers going all the way back yes. to when he was in seminary at Crozier Theological Seminary back in the 40s. So you can read a lot of his own words, a lot of his writings while he was in seminary where you get a clear picture of what his theological worldview is. And when you read those, depending on how thoroughly you want to read them, you come to the understanding that Christian was, uh, sorry, King was not a biblical regenerate Christian. He was more of a moralist. He was more of a humanist. He was more of a globalist because he partnered. It was more of an ecumenicist. He partnered with Hindus, Buddhists, um, uh, Middle Eastern religionists. Um, to, to, he was a, matter of fact, in his sermon uh, titled, I'm sorry, a paper that he wrote a seminary titled Preaching Mission, he said, and I'm quoting, I am a staunch advocate of the social gospel, unquote. Yeah. So King was a, so, he, he was a uh, social gospel conformist. Uh, he was more of a moralist, uh, a humanist than a uh, biblical well, he, uh, Christian. He, he named Walter Rauschenbusch as one of his largest influences, right. if that would tell you anything. All right, how do you decide whether to engage in debate and confrontation on social media, and at what point do you cease from debating? I, I, I don't debate people on social media. 
Um, I, I simply put what, I, what I'm thinking or an idea that I have, I push it forward and call it a day. Now, what I may do for fun <laughs> is I may engage somebody who's, you know, being a <clears throat> knucklehead or I, I've got 15 minutes to waste, this will be fun. Um, but but it's, it's, it's never for the purpose, and, and, here's, and l let me say this, I, 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 will, I will never be disrespectful to someone to the, to the degree that I've called them a, a name or a pejorative or something like that. But I, but I will make fun of what they've said or, or something that, that they've shared that's an idea. I will, I will expose that for its foolishness, for its folly. I will do that, but, but I, I usually don't resort to name calling. That's kind of, that's kind of childish behavior. I do think there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a way to, to operate from a standpoint of, of social media etiquette. Uh, that I think as believers we should all demonstrate. Now, uh, am I perfect at it? Absolutely not. And if, you ever, and if you ever see me demonstrating it in such a way that that's not the case, feel free to, to, to check me, call me on it, and, and uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, to, to make that right. But that's kind of my, my MO with social media. Yeah, I apply that same MO um, as well. I don't, uh, I don't debate people on social media. I don't think I'm on my own. Might, your battery might be shot. Yeah, my Is that it? Battery shot? Uh, I'm looking at Proverbs 26.5. <clears throat> Proverbs 26.5 says, Answer a fool as his folly okay. deserves, that he be not wise in his own eyes. That's what I employ uh, on social media, especially if any of you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen me do this. What I'll do is I'll ridicule the idea. I'll ridicule the comment. I'll never ridicule the person. Um, so a system that I've come up with, I, I have a uh, a clown emoji that I like to use, and I'll, <laughs> I'll award you any, from anywhere between one and five clowns, depending on how stupid your comment is. So depending on how absurd your comment is, you know, for the absolutely, incredibly, astoundingly absurd, you get five clowns. <laughs> if it's only, you know, minimally absurd, minimally stupid, you'll get one clown. So that's what I'll do. I'll just quote you, quote tweet you and I'll drop a series of clowns. And I've done that so often now that- People know, people get it. They're familiar with my clown scale. I mean, <laughs> they've actually come to copy it themselves uh, to where they'll go by and, and, and award uh, a certain number of clowns. But it's only to ridicule the idea. It's only to ridicule the comment in the context of Proverbs 26.5. I never uh, made fun of an individual. I never called someone a fool. I never called someone an idiot. I never do that. But the ideas that they approach us with and trying to, to hook us into a debate, a debate. Or argument. We won't do I'll it. Just, I'll just let the, I'll quote to them so the world can see how asinine what, what they're saying is, and then I'll award them a series of clowns. Right. Yeah. All right. As a Christian author, I want to promote biblical truth and combat wokeness. I'm concerned about cancel culture being silenced. Or I'm concerned about cancel culture and being silenced. Sure. And, and doing that. Do you have any advice or encouragement for Christians facing cancel culture? Yeah, we, we, I mean, we're trying to think through those pieces of the puzzle at, at G3. Uh, we have a YouTube page. We've got a lot of content that I just uploaded on there. We've got all of our archive material that, that, uh, that's been sitting in different spaces that now has gotten there. And we, we're, I mean, we're concerned that the, we, none of what we do is a shying away of, of truth, right? Of, of, of whether it's biblical sexuality uh, or wokeism or anything. And, uh, you know, so we have the concern of, of um, you know what happens if we've got this stuff on the YouTube page and all of a sudden it's gone and so we just our thought process is just doubling our efforts in spaces and places so that we never lose the material but we anticipate my thought would be expect that to take place I mean you, you should expect to be canceled at some point you should expect to be uh, you, you should expect the persecution that Scripture says that you're going to endure for for living a life that that's it you know that that chooses to honor God and so with that said I just would would make sure that I, I did whatever it, it, whatever it took to have duplicates, triplicates of what you need, where you need it, so that people can access it. And the more you can get off of those kinds of platforms and at least have your own, um, you know, your, your own resource. For example, I think it'd be wise uh, for you to have your own app with all of your materials on it accessible. So, I mean, that's what GTY does, that's what G3 does. We, we have our own, own application. Now, that, that, that's not gonna stop Google from shutting you down as, as, as can be the case, uh, but, but your hope is to try to navigate what you can, staying connected with those who wanna connect with you uh, in a way that, that's, that's helpful. But you, you cannot operate 
from a standpoint of fear. You, you really cannot. You've got to go forward, preach the truth, tell the truth, and, and, and believe God for the rest. So. Yeah, I really agree with that practical counsel there, Verge. As a matter of fact, I'm reading uh, Matthew 5. Um, I would just encourage that person to, number one, guard your mind and heart against what Virgil just said. Guard, guard your mind and heart against falling into an attitude and a mindset of fear, mm -hmm. anxiety. Guard your mind and heart against that. Um, I would encourage you to go back and listen to our podcast episode that's titled, Why Are You Afraid? Yes. Uh, go back and look at that. That's the episode upon which the book is, is based. But I would encourage you to go to Matthew 5 and read, what Jesus, read the words of Jesus, especially the latter part of <clears throat> verse 12, where, he, where Jesus says, when you are persecuted and insulted, rejoice. Mm -hmm. That's the attitude you should have. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And I also would encourage you to go look at Philippians chapter 1, verse, verse 29, yeah. where it says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer, suffer for, for his sake. sake. So if you're in that situation, don't be concerned, don't be anxious, rejoice. Be glad, be happy that the grace of Christ has shined upon you to where in his providence and in his uh, sovereignty, he has chosen providentially to uh, permit this situation uh, to come to fruition in your life, and you should rejoice in that. Mm -hmm. All right, I have, <clears throat> I have a black friend who has adopted many tenets of CRT, and I want to help lead him to a biblical position. Any advice or counsel for how I can help him? No. <laughs> no I, I'm only half kidding. Um, uh, you, I don't, I don't, that's a difficult question yeah. to answer. I don't know all the dynamics of the situation, uh, and there's no one, one answer fits all scenario that I can give you. There's not one thing that's gonna work with every black person so that now you have the, the black person answer that you can go and <laughs> take care of the, of the, that, the black person card. The black card, person I card, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have that. I would need black a, person alert, black person alert, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would need a lot more information to, to, to deal with that. I would simply, in a general sense, uh, you know, tell you that, that all of that is, is about relationship. You know, how, are you, how are you interacting? What are you, what are you saying? What do those conversations look like? One of the, one of the, the keys that I tried to give you while, while, I, while I had an opportunity to speak is the, the more that you can engage in those kinds of conversations devoid of emotion the better off you are. That, 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 that's a better position, that's a better circumstance from which to operate. If you're operating from a standpoint of, you, you can't wait to jump, jump in and nobody's gonna wanna deal with you, right? If, if that, or you're not that way and they start talking and you feel yourself just going, just stop, just stop. Figure something else out because you're not ready for that conversation. I will tell you, being here is important. Uh, being in spaces like this is important. Why? Because you're getting information that you wouldn't have otherwise. And that information is always helpful. I think more information helps you to calm down. I, I, when, I, when I would teach apologetics classes, I would tell people um, that, that, would, that would have the tendency to get riled up in situations. I said, listen, have you ever argued a, about the fact that, that two and two is four? I mean, have you ever gotten to a heated debate? Well, no. Well, why? Because well, you, you know that Two and two is four. Now, again, I, I know that there's a whole world of crazy critical thinking right now that's saying two and two is five, right? But no one's gonna get wound up about that debate. Why? Because you know the truth. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the more truth you have and know, the calmer you can be because it's not about you. Um, it, it's about a defense of the truth. And so you can operate from that vantage point. That's probably more than more to that than, than I could than I need to say. Yeah, I'll just at Virgil really just kind of hit on it. My counsel to you would just to be to be careful of what your motives are. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I thought the key word in the question was help. If you truly want to help the individual, then you'll take yourself and your bias out of it, take your position out of it. If you really want to help the person, uh, make sure that the manner in which you approach them to help them um, is, is rooted in pure motives, rooted in godly motives. You're not trying to win an argument. You're trying, not trying to win a debate. What you're trying to do is present them with the truth of the gospel, and, and then you, what you do is just do that, stick to that, and then trust God to work his word in the heart and mind of that person if he so chooses. But you need to take yourself out of the situation, <clears throat> be as objective as possible, and make sure your motives are right. 
in wanting to help the person, and then uh, you, you're not uh, in the position of, uh, you know, fidgety and going all emotionally uh, berserk uh, in that situation. You've removed yourself from it. What's at stake here is the truth of the gospel. You help them. Uh, you share with them as much as possible, but do it objectively, um, but with a pure motive and intention. And I'll let you answer this one because it's more kind of your people. Okay. Next SBC president, Askell or Barber? Askell. If he wins, will some of the churches that have left the SBC come back? No, for oh. clarity, the church that you are part of has left the F SBC, right? Praise Mill Baptist. Yes, Praise Mill Baptist is. You're no longer Mill Praise Mill Baptist. Now you're Praise Mill Church? No, Praise Mill Baptist. Oh. We, 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 How that, can you be a Baptist church and not be not part be, of the SBC? Not be SBC. We, we, were, we, were S, we were Baptist before the SBC was. That's how that works. Oh. Our church is older. So they should be joining you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The, the, the <clears throat> Praise Mill Baptist Church was, be, was, was uh, uh, put in place or was in place as a, as a church, uh, I want to say at least four or five years before the SBC actually uh, formed itself. And so um, <clears throat> we're, we're, we're good. Uh, if you're interested in, in why Dr. Josh Bice has written an article that you can go to G3, uh, men.org and he, he articulates his thought process very well. In fact, Justin uh, Peters had him on uh, his, his uh, a podcast and uh, he did a fantastic job of A, asking the right kinds of questions and unpacking that. So if you're interested in why the church and what the process looked like for the church to leave the SBC, uh, you can you can see what that is, but but again, we we've got friends who are still connected. Uh, you know, I, I I was a pastor, an associate pastor at a church that was SBC. There are good people who are still in the SBC. I wish the SBC well. There's no ill feelings or harm that that we wish them. I do hope uh, that that Tom Askell is the next president. But even if he is the next president, um, the 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 sentimentalism and pragmatism, which we'll talk about some tomorrow, that is infected the SBC will take 10 years at least to bring it back to, you know, to, to, uh, back to par, right, back to zero. And then it will take another 10 years to push it into a, a reformed uh, idea about worship where, where scripture is sufficient to inform all that we do in every facet of, of worship and life. And so, and, and, and Tom is very aware, this isn't a, hey, I won, it's over, y'all come back. It's, it's, a, it's a process, right? The conservative resurgence took 25 years to unfold and people who were there oh, for, for a lengthy period of time making sure that, that every, every uh, uh, committee member was placed in the right positions so that the conservatives could win. This is not a one and done situation with the SBC. So it, it'll be a part of a process. I wish Tom nothing but the best. We're, both Daryl and I have, have our, our book was uh, printed with Founders Press, which, which is over, uh, which, is, which uh, Tom Askell uh, is over. We have a, a great relationship with them. We'll continue to have that. I, I think I, I texted Tom or sent something out or tweeted him or, or something today and just to encourage him as he's going through the process. We pray for him. Uh, we, we pray for, for things to change and turn around uh, in the SBC, but uh, it's a long process. And um, so question. Is it yes or no? Short, short, short answer. Yep, yep, yep. Yes or no? Is the SBC beyond repair? Oh wow, it's more than a yes or no. I mean, no, no, it's a yes or no question. <laughs> I mean, it either is or it isn't. If it isn't, there's no need to explain it. If there is, there's, it's, it's self-evident. Yes or no? Is it beyond repair? I, I, I here's what I would say to that in in, in this public setting. Um, I, I would say that for me and the and the role that I played in that space. And what I've, what I've experienced and seen in that space, I, I don't believe I'm qualified to make a, a, a judgment like that. Are you qualified? I'm not qualified, but my answer is yes. <laughs> it's beyond repair. <laughs> it's beyond repair. Yeah. It's, it's beyond repair. I, I, I just, I, 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 I'm, maybe, maybe here's, where, here's where I come from. I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I'm hopeful. I, I, I don't want to see it. I, you I don't, don't want the answer to be yes. No, I don't. I don't want the answer yeah. to be. I don't want no. the answer to be. No, yes. I don't think anybody does want yeah. the answer. Yeah, to I don't yes. want the answer to be yes. But no. if it's yes, no question, I'm answering yes. No. <laughs> All right. We lived in Georgia for six years and struggled with Sunday being the most segregated day of the week. What effective biblical responses have you seen to unifying the white, black, Hispanic, etc. church within the same city? 
Two things. One, the gospel. Two is the idea that, that, uh, the idea that posited this quote. We did an entire episode mm -hmm. on this quote mm -hmm. alone mm -hmm. uh, when we were at uh, G3. Mm -hmm. um, and the, and the, uh, the, if you want to hear the lengthy, hour-long version, uh, it's called Woke Church. And then we, t we circled back and did, and did Woke Church Part 2. So if you want to go hear those, hear a lengthy answer to that question, you can. Simply to say that, that the quote comes from Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, and, and the quote in and of itself is, is not an accurate assessment of what's actually taking place in the church. 12 o'clock is not the most segregated hour, right? And not from a standpoint of, of you not being able to go and experience church wherever you... There's no church that I can't walk into as a black man. When you're talking about segregation, you're talking about a law that requires me to stay on a side of a street, to, to drink from a specific fountain, to do some specific things. Now, if people are choosing to go where they're located in a particular city to a specific church, that's a choice you're making. Segregation is something that was enforced. So the idea that, that, that it's the most segregated hour, that's a nice little quote to, that, that, that King popularized but it's, it's not an accurate assessment of where we are today. That's a, the idea behind that is a re-problematizing. You've heard us use that word. It's a re-problematizing of something that took place, historically speaking, as if it's the same way today. And that's absolutely not the case. Now, the other aspect of the question, which is, uh, you know, what do we do to, to, to fix the, the, the segregation? Again, my premise would be, People are choosing to go where they go based upon what they desire to do. They're not forced to do so. They're free to, I was free to walk into this church. I had no inhibitions about doing that. There was no sign on the wall that kept that from taking place. So I, I go where I want to. And if someone is staying at an all black church, it's because that's what they choose to do. It's not because, it's not because that's the only place that they can go. Uh, they can go wherever they, they choose to go. So I, I, the, the nature of the question, I think, needs to, be, needs to be looked at from a standpoint of how it's framed. And because it, 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 based upon how it's framed, it, it, it then posits the next idea, which is this is a problem, right? Now, what can we do to fix it? And my argument there would be there's nothing for you to fix. The church is not yours. It's Christ's. So what you and I are to do is we're to go and be obedient to what the word says, which is to go and preach the gospel to all men. And as, they, as the gospel is preached, hearts will be transformed, and the power of that gospel will draw them into a church. And if you're the one that shared the gospel with them, guess where they're probably going to go? They're probably going to go to church with you. And so that'll be the opportunity. What do we do? We preach the gospel. This is, this is the kind of thinking that if we're not careful, lends itself to the idea that, A, the gospel isn't enough, and B, I've got to do something more. And, and, and those, those, those kinds of things are things we need, to, we, need to, we, need to, we need to push back against and really open the scripture and think about it. So. Yeah. yeah, I'm thinking about the episode we did on the Leave Loud movement with Jamar Tisby, yes. and, uh, who's uh, uh, spearheading that movement where he's urging uh, black evangelicals to leave uh, predominantly white churches, if that's what they are, to, to leave loud, to protest on your way out. We did an entire episode on that issue. We titled it Activist Theology. So I would encourage you to go back and listen to the episode that's titled Activist Theology. Uh, personally, one of my favorite episodes that, that we've done where we, we kind of walk you through uh, why that whole Leave Loud movement is unbiblical. Um, but um, uh, I, I think the question presupposes, uh, uh, it's, it's presuppositional. It's presuppositional on its face. Yeah. Uh, be, the presupposition is that in order for a biblical local church to be truly biblical, it must, like we said this morning, it must represent multicolored. It must be multicolored. <clears throat> and Virgil just nailed it. The church, is, 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 the church doesn't belong to you. Um, God, every, every, truly, every true believer in Christ is by faith automatically a part of the universal church. Mm -hmm. Automatically a part of it. So what right do we have at the local church level to put these stipulations on something that Christ doesn't apply to his universal church? You become a member of the church by faith, and that occurs monogistically by God alone. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that by his doing, that is by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By his doing. So who am I to say, well, your church at the local level needs to look like this? 
See, there's a difference between having a multicolored or multi-ethnic church and having a multicolored, uh, multi-ethnic congregation. <clears throat> That's good. We're in a church right now. Multiple ethnicities represented. But unless these multiple ethnicities are believers, right. you don't have a multi-ethnic church. church. Yep. The church, by definition, is comprised of believers, not attenders. So that's the distinction that we have to make. Mm -hmm. And whomever God wants to bring into his church, he's going to bring them. Absolutely. If you, if you recognize at the, end of the, at the end of my talk, I, I read from what was it, uh, Revelation 7, yeah. 9 mm -hmm. following, this idea of, of many nations, many ethnicities, that's the work of, of Christ. That's, that's the work of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All you have to do is go do what you were commissioned to do, which is to go and preach the gospel. Be faithful to the preaching of the gospel. And, 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 and all of that color stuff takes care of itself in the end. I can take you to some churches on the west side of Atlanta where I grew up. They're predominantly black churches. They're all black. They're all black. But this question, whenever it is raised, you touched on this earlier, Virgil, it's like the onus is always on the white church to become more dark. It's never on the dark church to become more white. Right. You know, and in the area where I grew up over there in uh, 30314 zip code, you're not going to find Caucasians living over there. No Hispanics live over there. No Asians live there. You know, uh, the, 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 so this whole idea, of, listen, let me just say this. <laughs> With all due respect to how God used Dr. Martin Luther King when he did, and I get that. But Dr. King's, his worldview was just wrong. He throws out this statement like this from a speech that he gave. And here we are six decades later. Still talking about still it. Still talking about Needing it. to re-problematize need, it. Needing to re-problematize I mean, come on. Really? I mean, so, so the, 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 with all due respect to the questioner who lived in Georgia for six years, I lived in Georgia for all my life, with the, with the exception of the past three years. I know that state like the back of my hand. I know that city, city of Atlanta where I grew up like the back of my hand. Um, Churches are not segregated because if to say that a church is segregated presupposes a, 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 a standard or a benchmark that Christ doesn't apply That's good. to his church. Mm -hmm. So we need to get rid of this question. We just need to stop asking it with all due respect. All right. This is the last one from the audience. We had a couple others, but I'll save those because we're going to wrap them up with some other questions here in a moment. Okay. Could you please help my pastor and teach him how to tie a bow tie? <laughs> It I would, got you. I got you. It would strongly compliment his fedora that his wife loves. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, we could both do that. By the way, these, these ties are the ones you have to tie. Yeah, these are tie ties. These we don't do clip-ons. Do clip All right. What do black people experience that white folk don't know about or understand? Are white people blind to racism? I, so, don't, I don't know what black I people... Have no I don't have no idea. I, I have no idea. If you find out, come, come tell, tell me what us, they did. So are you profiled? Can you go for a walk without an ID? Did you have to teach your kids how to respond when an officer pulls them over? Are you treated, treated differently on the basis of your color? Are you pulled over for driving while black? Are you expected to vote a certain way? Is voter ID racist? Are, are you too incompetent to get voter ID? I have no idea. I, I, to, to every single one of those, I have no idea how to, how to respond to any of that because any, any issue that I run into related to that, I've never experienced through the lens of the color of my skin. None of it, ever. So, I mean, I, I even, even if someone came to me and, and said something blatantly, what we would all identify as racist, I would attribute that to they're stupid. Not, not to anything related. It says more about you than it ever says about me. So it's not even a conversation. Like I'm not even going to spend the time entertaining what, was, what the motivation was. It was stupid. And that's about as much time as I have for that. Yeah, that's, that's a five clowner right there, man. That, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> if, if we were on Twitter right now, that would get five, five clowns. clowns. Yeah. So you can go for a walk without ID? I mean, You're not pulled over for that reason? Nope. You've been pulled over? 
I have been pulled over. How did how it work out? It, it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it worked out. Do you want me to tell the story? I, I do, told yeah. You? Go ahead. All right. Um, I, was, I, was, I was telling Pastor Jim a story. Hey, about, Bert, I got to say this. Yes. Man. Can you, like, give us the... The snippet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he wants me to get a snippet. Okay, let me give a snippet. I, I, uh, I got pulled over by an officer. I was headed out, driving too fast, passed the stop sign, didn't stop all the way. I, the lights <clears> blow up, right? So I, apparently, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid, obviously, because I had, I had my cell phone, and I literally, the cop is behind me, and I literally, in the car, I took a picture, and the picture, I could show it to you if you want to see it, it's of my face and the lights behind me. I took the picture because I thought, dang it, this is going to be funny. <laughs> That's the real reason I took the picture. I took the picture, and I put it down. And then he comes up, we do all the stuff, and you know, you blew through the stop sign. I was like, I know I'm headed to such and such. He's like, all right, let me get your license. And I fills out the thing, comes back. And uh, I took the ticket from him, and I said, listen, because this, tw- this is 2020. I said, listen, with the, you know, all the verdicts and all this stuff happening, now officers are getting a bad rap. And, uh, and we just had an exchange, black guy, white cop, you know, this is, this is the narrative. I said, so why don't you do me a, why don't you do me a solid and uh, let's take a picture together. I, I, there was absolutely no fear. I just thought this would be cool. I took a snapshot of he and I and, and uh, him giving me the ticket, took a picture. And I took that picture and I did a side by side of A, the police officer uh, car behind me and B, me and the police officer. And I'd written something up on social media thinking this is probably going to go nowhere. My friends will get a laugh at me, and that'll be it. Well, this thing blows up, about 80,000 likes and shares, and it goes all over the country. In fact, uh, I found out later from the officer that there were police uh, stations around the country that reached out to him and, and just said, hey, great job. You know, cause I, basically, because I had said in the piece, I said, you know, I, I didn't fear for my life, all the stuff that you named. I didn't fear for my life. I wasn't afraid. I, I knew I'd done wrong. I knew that da, 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 all of that stuff. And uh, the exchange was respectful, but I did get the ticket, you know. And so I, I was tr- trying to make a joke of it. Well, n- needless to say, the news media in, this, in Omaha heard about it, and they actually called me and said, hey, we want to put you and that officer together and do a news story. Uh, so they did. They did a news story. I went down and saw the guy, and we were, you know, he hugged me. He's like, man, thank you for the positive feedback and you know all these officers I was like man that's great but then I still had to pay for the ticket. Verge, <laughs> what I want to know is how much was the ticket? It was about a hundred bucks, a little wow, over hundred bucks. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I paid it though. Man. I was in the wrong. Yeah. To what extent is your experience in America contingent on the color of your skin? I have no idea. That depends on the individual. I have no idea like I have no I don't there's there's not like okay I'll be right back. You know, I'm keeping record. Let me look. Let me check my records. I, that's not. I, I don't. I, I don't have that. Like I don't. Like I, I don't. I have no answer for that. Was that? I didn't even know that was that funny. I your just life thought, wasn't better when you were a white man, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. So you have no bar by which to no. judge. No. No, I didn't. I didn't. I've been black my whole life. I don't have a. <laughs> Let me check my records of how this has been, how this has been going. I'll be right back. <laughs> all right. On February 27th, it was Racial Reconciliation Sunday in the Yeah, S- in the so are you, we all reconciled. Did y'all know that? On a- <laughs> We're all reconciled. Did y'all know the SBC reconciled us all on that day? He reconciled- the nomination did. The nomination did. Looky there. Wave that magic wand. Boop. Y'all are reconciled. <laughs> I saw that, and I could not believe that they were doing that. It was Racial Reconciliation Day. So let me finish the question. I'm sorry. (laughs) This is going to come as a shock to most people, but I saw both of you post negative Twitter comments on that subject. What's the issue with that? Are you opposed to racial reconciliation? I am, actually. Yes, I am. I am opposed to it. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. We both subscribe to the idea that racists don't reconcile hearts do. Uh, in fact, I, D- D- Daryl coined that, and then I, I, I took it a step further when, I, when we were uh, in being interviewed by Ali Beth Stuckey and, just a- and gave the example of, okay, let's say that this is a real thing, right? 
who, who is the black representative that's gonna represent all black people? And then who, who's y'all's white representative that you're gonna send to reconcile on behalf of all white people? What are gonna be the terms of the reconciliation? And how will it be reported to us all that we've now been fully reconciled? Do you see how silly this all is? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day- And reconcile from what? Absolutely. Reconcile from what? So if this whole idea of racial reconciliation, I think I made that clear my position on it in the message that I just gave, yeah. the whole idea of racial reconciliation is totally nonsensical. So for instance, let's pretend today is racial Recon reconciliation Friday. <laughs> What are we, what are Jim and I being reconciled over? <laughs> yeah, that could be an issue, but we, we, we don't need to be reconciled over that. So, so the point I'm trying to make is this. The whole idea of reconciliation, presu reconciliation presupposes that there is an objective issue of conciliation that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. What, recon what the idea of racial reconciliation bids you do first above everything else is to acknowledge who this person is based on the color of their skin. That's what the racial and racial recon rec rec reconciliation forces you to do. That's it the very problem at the heart of the... Exactly the right. So white people, go find a black person to reconcile with them. <laughs> black people, go find a white person and reconcile with them. Just because they're white. It makes no sense. It's and just my, the and, dumbest and, thing. And my hope is that, I hope everywhere we go to debunk this to the degree that every time you see it, you laugh. It's five clowns. You laugh. <laughs> every time you see it, you just throw it, you, you, that's it's just, garbage. It's that's ridiculous. ridiculous. All right, this is the last one for tonight and then uh, we got some more to tackle tomorrow. What is happening in our seminaries, in our churches, in our denominations? We used to have uh, coalitions around the gospel. People used to get together for the gospel. And now some of these people who have gotten did, together for the gospel and coalesced, coalesced around the gospel right. are embracing some of the very things that you guys are here criticizing and taking issue with. And that is not how it should be, and that's not how it was even 10 years ago. Right. So there is a drift taking place. Right. Would we call it an apostasy? What's happening in, what's happening? What's going on on the large scale? Well, I think they were, I think, I think they were captured, those organizations you mentioned, uh, were captured in this wave uh, uh, with, with regard to wokeism. And they went there, and, and really it caused, it caused the downfall of one and the teetering of the other. Um, the, the, the issue really now is what's happening, what, what's happening in their, uh, it, what they're doing to rebrand themselves, right? So, so what, what, what TGC is doing to rebrand itself is they're trying to find this middle ground. So they'll do a video now where you've got both sides, someone who's a proponent of, of, of CRT, someone who's antagonistic against CRT, and they'll be, they'll be kind of going at it in a, in a debate, right? You see this, this format where, where they get all of their issues out and they get all of their issues out, and then they sit down and talk, and it's not really a debate. Uh, in fact, if you watch the, the quote-unquote debate, uh, it's a man who steps up who, who's supposed to be standing against CRT. See, they won't ask a Daryl Harrison to come debate. They won't ask a Virgil Walker, a Vody Bauckham to come and have these kinds of conversations and set it up in the real debate format. They won't ask a James White who can handle himself in that space to come and debate these issues because that's not really what they're after. What they're now after in these arenas are for, for you to be, they're really wanting to be tone police. And so now the, the, the issue is thou shalt be nice. Right? It, it, it's, it's, never, it's never about what's right and wrong about the issues and the subject matter. It's, oh, you've, you had some good points and you said it in a, in a nice way. And, oh, you had some good points and you said it in a nice way. Now, what would you say to the people who are on your side that they could do better to be nice? And that's the conversation that's now being had. So it's this kind of third wave niceness that's, that's supposed to permeate all of what we say rather than saying, no, there's some real distinctions here that need to be talked about, even passionately if need be, in an effort to examine what scripture has to say about these. And either we need to accept one and reject the other or accept the other and reject the one, but we're gonna stand for something regardless. And that's not what's actually 
happening. There's a rebranding that's actually taking place that you're going to see uh, happen. That, that, they, they recognize woke, wokeness will leave you broke. They recognize that. So now the next step in the phase is a rebranding of, 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 of things. It's kind of the, the, the idea, hey, we went, we went too far here. We went too far. Here's the middle ground that we can find ourselves in and, and, uh, and proceed forward. There's, there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of uh, terminologies and jargon around that. I won't, I won't bore you with all of that uh, this evening, but, but just know that that's what's happening and that's what you're going to be seeing moving so forward. So between... yeah, to, to that note, just real quick, Jim, yeah. uh, to, to Virgil's point, I would encourage you to go back and listen to our episode titled A Nuanced Gospel, mm -hmm. because this is what happened. What Virgil just described is the integration of nuance as the new um, uh, hermeneutic. Nuance, uh, and the irony is that anything, nothing that's nuanced can be hermeneuticized, if that's a word, uh, but that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to do, use nuance as a play on a way to uh, offer a more uh, palatable hermeneutic so as to make the gospel less offensive, make standing for truth less offensive under the guise of what I call the 11th commandment, that thou shalt be nice. So check out our episode, uh, A Nuanced Gospel. So in, in all of the Gospel Coalition events mm -hmm. uh, that they have and all of the Together for the Gospel events that they have combined, how many times have you guys been asked to come speak? Zero. And again, I, I, I don't know at this point because of what they stand for that I would take an invitation uh, from them. It would be, it, I, I, would, I would question why I was there, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, Dal, Dal nor I seek a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we've never been one to seek a platform trying to get somewhere or, or be, I mean, that's not how we operate. We're grateful for any opportunity that we have and we try to deliver uh, something that's beneficial for all those who, are, who are, are listening. So we're not chasing anyone's platform. Um, at the end of the day, we just, we, we want to do what we talked about, which is just stand for truth. Yeah. Um, we want to be about that, and if, if you hear us and believe that what we bring is going to be of value, then, 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 then there's mutual benefit in that. And if not, we're fine with that. We don't, we, we're not, we're, neither of us are losing sleep because we haven't received an invitation from them. But I, I do recognize who they do platform and what they do platform, and that gives me all the information I need to know exactly where they're going. Yep, yep. All right, uh, one last thing. Josh? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, what, what is he up to? Uh-oh. What? What? I'm afraid of what's going to jump out of it. So. <laughs> it's a clown. Right. It's, a clown. <laughs> it's five clowns. Five little clowns. <laughs> Oh, that's good. Would you please open that up for us? I don't know if I want to open this thing, man. I, it's not that I don't trust you, Jim. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> man, what in the world? Watch Black Lives Matter. Oh, that's a noose. <laughs> If you call it a noose, we could have 15 FBI agents here tomorrow right. investigating. Right, that. right. <laughs> Dude, somebody, somebody went in somebody, on that yeah. one. Somebody knew what they were doing. Wow, that's impressive. I had to go back to the hotel with glitter all over. <laughs> well, at least your wife's here, so she knows what's, you know. Yeah, she knew I wasn't at the club. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> She know, she know I wasn't in downtown yeah. Kootenai. <laughs> wow. Man, you don't need a knife for that. I know y'all saying, man, hurry up with this. Keeping them, keeping them in suspense, man. I'm gonna need a knife for this, man. Anybody got all these, all the hunters? Oh snap! Oh, yeah, there, <laughs> will you open that, people? <laughs> oh, Don't ask you. for a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody in this room with a gun. Yeah, don't don't come mess with nobody here at 
at Don't at be messing with these people up in uh, Idaho, man. KCC, you know, they are prepared. They don't play right here. They are prepared, man. Amazon? No, y'all didn't. <laughs> no, y'all didn't. Can you hold? No, y'all didn't. Oh, my gosh. You know what they've done? What you, you know got? what they've gone and done? Man, you guys are going to make me tear up up here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Look at that. I finally got my Tonka dump right. truck. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Did you, did you know about this? You didn't know about this? It, it, was, it was our little attempt at racial reconciliation. Yeah. <laughs> Once you We're said, reconciled. We're reconciled. When she said that, when she said it was my fault that you didn't have one, I thought, well, we have to do something like that. That was not my idea, but it Thank was a good one. Thank y'all. Thank you guys. Yeah. This is this is awesome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are done for tonight. So you are free to leave whatever you want here. Please take any valuables that you have, weapons that you have, home with you. <laughs> but anything else, you can leave on the tables for tomorrow. And doors will open at 8 a.m. We will have food out, coffee again, and session starts at 8:45 tomorrow morning. All right. Have a good night. You're dismissed. Thank you. Be gracious to